Board of Education for May 5th, 2020 is called to order. For tonight's meeting, any item that will be voted on has been posted as required by state law. This meeting is being streamed live on channel 28 and will be replayed throughout the next two weeks. Please check the district website for replay times. This meeting is also being streamed live on our PPS TV services website. Welcome to our viewing audience and thank you for joining us virtually. Tonight, we're looking forward to hearing from a student, teachers and principals about their experience with distance learning. We will also be voting on a revised business agenda tonight and on a resolution uh, to approve a 20% furlough through July of this year. But first, we'll start by recognizing that this week is Teacher and School Administrators Appreciation Week. Director Bailey, would you be so kind as to introduce this item? Thank you, Chair Constam. Uh, interesting times we're in. Every year, students and families look forward to celebrating our amazing teachers and school administrators. And while this year's Teacher and School Administrators Appreciation Week doesn't have the usual school traditions that we do, we still want to acknowledge our educators and let them know how much we appreciate and respect all of you. This year especially, we appreciate how much you're working to adapt to a new way of teaching and connecting to students. I've witnessed this firsthand in my household as my wife, who is a proud member of the Portland Association of Teachers, has had to meet the challenges of online teaching. She's lucky in that she is very technologically savvy and had already incorporated Google Classroom and other online tools into her teaching before COVID changed our lives. I watched as she has coordinated with her principal and fellow art teachers online, worked hard to connect with all of her students, and has come up with new lesson plans and projects that her students can do at home. Even so, it has not been easy for her, and connecting online is not the same as connecting in person. I know it has been even more of a challenge for teachers who have less experience with online teaching tools, So it's great to see them rise to the challenge. So to all our teachers and building administrators, please consider this to be a virtual cupcake delivered to your virtual break room. Thank you so much for all that you do for our students every day. Please stay safe and healthy in the days ahead. I love that, the virtual cupcake. This is the time of year when our offices are usually overflowing with cupcakes and cookies and casseroles and all the things that parents bring forward to our teachers and administrators. Um, the board will now vote on resolution number 6107 to celebrate teacher and school administrator appreciation week of May 4th, 2020. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Director DePass moves and Director Brim Edwards seconds the motion to adopt resolution 6107. Ms. Bradshaw, is there any public comment on resolution 6107? All right, is there any board discussion on this resolution? The board will now vote on resolution 6107, which resolves that the Portland Board of Education declares the week of May 4th, 2020, Teacher and School Administrator Appreciation Week in recognition and appreciation of their dedicated efforts to ensure the success of students in all Portland public schools. All in favor, please indicate by saying yes. 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 All opposed, please indicate by saying no. Any abstentions? Resolution 6107 is approved by a vote of seven to zero with student representative lateral voting. Yes. All right, thank you. And thank you, Director Bailey. Um, at this time, the board will vote on the business agenda. Board members, are there any items you would like to pull for discussion? If there are any items you'd like to pull for discussion, we'll set them aside and vote at the end of the meeting. Um, is there anything? Uh, yes, I would like to pull the Lincoln, uh, res the resolution, I don't have the exact number, just for a couple questions. That's, su that's sufficient, we got it. Uh, Ms. Bradshaw, are there any changes to the business agenda? Uh, Roseanne at, or Kara, actually, do you have that resolution number handy for the Lincoln Guaranteed Maximum Price? Uh, let me pull up for you. Also, were all these were all these posted? Yes. 
Inc including the ones that came in late? Yes, but we also did discuss some process improvements around um, accessing uh, contracts and the way they're posted because I, I think it was a little hard to find. And um, what was that resolution number, Roseanne? Oh, I am still searching for it. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Apologies. I guess I can ask now, do I have a motion and a second to adopt the business agenda minus the Lincoln resolution? So moved. Second. Director Scott moves and Director DePass seconds the adoption of the business agenda with the exception of... Getting uh, there. Actually, actually, Director Brim Edwards, you didn't want to pull it. You just wanted to ask some questions. No, I, 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 let's have it just be separate. Okay. Okay. So, so it is that resolution number. It's actually six one zero one. Okay. So the board will now vote on resolutions six one zero two through six one zero six in the business agenda. All in favor, please indicate by saying yes. One yes. second. We yes. Do that. Yes. Oh. yes. Actually has four components. <laughs> so are we going to wait and vote on all four components of 6101? Because it, it covers Lane, Cesar Chavez, and Ricky, as well as Lincoln. Yeah. We, uh, the resolutions, the way that we've done them in the past are the, the contracts, the individual contracts. That's the way that it was posted. So we have posted in uh, under resolution 6101 all the new contracts under one. So okay. That's, um, all the expenditure contracts and uh, am amendments to existing contracts. Yeah, so let, let's just pull 6101 and then answer the and then we'll questions. just ask the questions regarding the Lincoln piece uh, uh, with the understanding that there are three other aspects to that contract or to that um, package of amendments. So the board will now vote on resolution 6102 through 6106 in the business agenda. All in favor, please indicate by saying yes. 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 All yes. opposed, please indicate by saying no. Any abstentions? Business agenda is approved by a vote of seven to zero with student representative lateral voting. Yes. All right. Um, we'll go on to student and public comment. Um, before we begin, I'd like to review our guidelines for public comment. The board thanks the community for, or actually, um, even though it's not our usual practice, uh, in the interest of uh, allowing Dan Young, who is on this call right now, to uh, continue on with the rest of his evening with his family. Let's um, let's discuss the the item from the business agenda that we've just pulled so we can um, commence with voting on that. Um, so, um, Dan Young, are you there? I am here, and actually, we also have our senior product manager, uh, Eric Gerding, and senior director of OSM, Marina Cresswell, here as well, just in case we have questions. Okay, I just did all three of you a solid here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, Director Brim Edwards, do you want to pose your questions about um, the Lincoln Guaranteed Maximum Price Amendment? Great. Um, so um, because we don't post the amendments or the contracts anymore, there was just a couple items that I wanted just to pull out that I had questions about. Um, so one of the things in this, when we were doing our bond planning earlier, um, we had um, as a principal stated that we uh, believed it was better um, to move away from quote, portables. Um, most of the time they weren't actually portables. They'd been there a long time and, you know, not the, the best in terms of uh, the best environment in terms of health and safety um, and security. And so um, I am interested in uh, just the, in this particular case, uh, we're building an entirely new building. One of the ed specs is a teen parent center. 
Um, so I was surprised that it wasn't included as part of the new building, um, just given that that's what we did at Franklin, and I believe at Roosevelt, that it was in, in, encompassed in the new building. So um, I'm wondering, uh, Dan or somebody else, if you could speak to um, why um, this wasn't incorporated into the new building and design and um, the the confidence you have in the the uh, portables that are going to be used in this case. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I, I think I'll start with the answer and I might let uh, Eric Gerding add some detail to that. Uh, the the Team Parent Center has some unique requirements that the the way that the new Lincoln High School is situated uh, makes it somewhat of a challenge to get in there. Having a, a dedicated outdoor space, having a dedicated separate entrance and some other requirements. It became a challenge to figure out how to best fit that into the ground floor of the Lincoln High School building. So we looked at other options, including creating its own standalone building. And that's really where the design started to move towards is its own standalone building uh, on the property, closer to where the existing high school is now. <clears throat> And then the option came, or the proposal came, to reuse the existing portables on site. So the portables that are Lincoln are very unique. They're unlike any of the other portables that we have in the district. Uh, they're what are called stage classrooms, and they meet quite a few different uh, green building requirements uh, and standards. So they're uh, a much better quality product than what we typically see. And in most of our modernizations, we have opportunities to reuse at some level. We're not always taking down the entire building. And there's efficiencies that we're able to gain from you reusing some of those materials or items. Lincoln has very few of those, but this happened to be one of those. So we are pretty confident that that design, of having those units stand alone, or they'll have their own their own little parking area, their own entrance, their own outdoor play area, will be a good fit for the teen parent center. So uh, Eric's probably got some more detail than that, so I'll let him jump in here if I missed. All right, thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, part of it was also uh, in our development of the design where we were having budget issues. Um, you know, we were looking at, you know, how could we economize and utilize what is existing? So we're using these existing um, concessions building and these portables that were just finished uh, for the 2016-17 uh, year. Uh, are really state-of-the-art and great buildings. And so we were realizing um, almost a million dollars of savings on the project in schematic design when we made that shift. And so since the shift was made later in design, it's really not fully kind of vetted out as far as the full scope. And so normally it would be included in the regular cost of the budget, but we just have the special allowance because we're still uh, developing the design. And just two follow-ups. So one of the other issues with portables that has been raised um, was that if you're trying to create sort of a secure envelope for students that um, having portables, and I know we have them all over the district, um, but there was an intent of moving them back, um, that we'd be setting up a sort of freestanding structure, um, built in some sort of security, or we feel comfortable, the district feels comfortable that, um, having this as a standalone structure is secure for the, the students and staff? Um, yes, um, definitely. I, I think with, as Dan referred to the design of the main building, if you could imagine, it's really just, it's on taking up whole city blocks. And so we have street conditions almost all the way around, loading zones, uh, fired lane, pedestrian easement, where, you know, having a nice outdoor play area was really difficult to design. Also, we're looking at loading and unloading off of public streets and uh, loading areas. And so having this separate structure, it's actually inside the secured parking lot for staff. So to, to be able to get in to drop off, uh, you do have to go through a gate and there's a secured entrance there. And there's also a secured entrance off of 14th Avenue. Um, if someone is being dropped off there, they can come and get buzzed in and uh, allowed to come onto the campus there. So yes, we've, we've done a lot of security review with this and, and uh, district security supports the design. Great. 
Um, so I just have one other question and then a comment is um, there's another half a million dollars going for uh, field storage. And I know this is an issue for a lot of other high schools that they've got these shipping containers, which the rationale for why we're building a separate structure is shipping containers are less than ideal. Is that something that as we go back and look at the other high schools and it sounds like Madison um, has this, but is that something for the, just in terms of equity for the other schools that would be getting rid of the shipping containers as well? Yeah, as you noted, the, um, the other high schools or the Roosevelt and, and Franklin and Grant have used a mixture of uh, containers or fenced areas underneath the bleachers or some uh, in permanent structure storage. Uh, the, out, the exterior and the containers certainly cause a number of issues. There's a lot of vandalism to them. There's a lot of theft to them. And certainly when you're just under the bleachers. So it's, it's preferred uh, to be able to have a permanent structure. So uh, Madison has gone that route. They have a, they're going to have all their equipment with the building. And then what we have in the GMP is an allowance. So uh, effectively, we think we can afford to build a permanent structure instead of putting those containers out there. Uh, so that's what the plan is for Lincoln. There's no specific plan to go back to the other schools right now and change what they have. If, if funding is available and the priorities are such that we have the capital funds to go back and do that, we will. Uh, but there's no, no specific plan at the moment. Okay. And then the last thing, and this is more for the superintendent, is um, uh, right before COVID um, and things started to shut down, there was a board discussion about the um, student um, health center. And I know that um, Brenda Martinick had had um, a conversation with uh, broad base of community providers, and I would be interested in getting an update on where, where we are with that. And I, I recognize that that happened right before the, um, the pandemic hit, and we really had a huge pivot to make, but I'd be interested in getting an update on where we are with that. So not a question for you, Dan, it's more of a, um, uh, Brenda Martinick and the superintendent. And I don't need it for tonight's vote. I'm gonna be fine, uh, but I like it at a certain date. I can certainly speak a little bit to it if you want, or um, I don't have to. You, you can either provide it offline. We don't need to, um, yeah, Brenda, if you can just provide an update to the board um, since that that meeting, that would be great. Sure, sure. Uh, so uh, Julia is correct. Uh, the day that we had um, the health form, the student health form was the day that uh, we also stood up our emergency operations center, and we've been working on that ever since. But we've also been doing uh, some additional work in the background in regards to how health centers are going to look like in the future. Uh, we have had conversations with um, Alexandra Lowell and Multnomah ESD um, in our uh, student health forum discussion back in March. We did talk a lot about telehealth uh, and about how we could provide um, medical uh, and nursing services to a number of different students who don't have the traditional uh, school-based health center. So uh, what we are in our initial stages of discussing is telehealth uh, and a partnership. The county is very interested in developing a partnership with Portland Public Schools and Multnomah ESD uh, and the county to see um, how health has changed. Uh, it's very innovative. Uh, and based on um, all of the things that have been going on uh, lately and how rapidly everybody has um, had to uh, become a distance learning or a teletherapy or a telehealth uh, consumer, uh, we are uh, trying to uh, expand upon that and build on that. And so, uh, so I just want to let you know that it hasn't been completely placed on the back burner because we know that we have to get back to it. Um, so, so that's uh, what we're looking at right now. We were just actually, uh, James was on a phone call with Peyton um, just today, uh, talking a little bit more about that. Um, and we did have a meeting with Alexandra Lowell uh, to discuss that as well. So, so that is my little mini update. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Sure.
Uh, did you have a question, uh, Director Lowry? I thought I heard you. No, it wasn't me, but I would like to say as we vote on this resolution that I'm super excited, um, especially for the lane floor. Um, if any of you have been out to Lane Middle School and seen the cafeteria floor, you know this is desperately needed. So I appreciate the work that's happening on these other items as well, Dan. Thank you. Great. Okay, do I have um, uh, a motion to bring forward resolution 6101 from the business agenda? So no. moved. Second. <clears throat> Director Scott moves, and um, I think that was Director Brim Edwards seconds. Seconded, the board will now vote on resolution 6101. All in favor, please indicate by saying yes. 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 All opposed, please indicate by saying no. Any abstentions? All right, resolution 6101 is approved by a vote of seven to zero with student representative lateral voting. Yes. All right, um, so we will move on to our public comment period. I'd like to review our guidelines before we do. We thank the community for taking the time to attend this meeting and provide your comments to the board. We value public input as it informs our work and we look forward to hearing your thoughts, reflections and concerns. Our responsibility as a board is to actively listen. Board members and the superintendent will not respond to comments or questions during public comment, but our board office will follow up on board related issues raised during public testimony. Guidelines for public input emphasize respect and consideration of others. We request that complaints about individual employees be directed to the superintendent's office as a personnel matter. If you have materials or items you'd like to provide to the board or superintendent, we ask that you email them to public comment at pps.net. If you're watching our board meeting via the live stream while waiting, please make sure that you mute prior to your turn to speak. If you leave it on, it will create feedback and you will be muted by the meeting administrator and we'll have to come back to you. Uh, please make sure also when you begin your comment that you clearly state your name and spell your last name. You will have three minutes to speak. You'll hear a sound after three minutes, which means it's time to please conclude your comments. We appreciate your time and your input and thank you for your cooperation. Ms. Bradshaw, do we have anyone signed up for student or public comment? Yes, we have a John Foley. John, you should be unmuted. Yeah. I can't hear you. I didn't get your last name, Don, but are you with us? I hear you. Okay, I we can hear you, I believe. Hi. I am a partnership specialist with the U.S. Census Bureau, and I just want to do a, a quick update to the school board. Uh, just to make more for a discussion later on after. So, so Don, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know your your last name, but if you could speak any more closely into your microphone, that would be helpful. You're kind of coming in and out. Okay, I, I'm I've, I'm right up against the microphone. Let's hope this works. But if not, stop me again. That's much uh, better. Anyway, I, I'm with. Okay, I'm with the U.S. Census Bureau. I'm a partnership specialist. I am the, the school district liaison to the 2020 Census uh, Project. And I just wanted to do a quick rundown for you on what's going on with the census conference. It is uh, a person engagement office. And Scott Bailey and I have been talking about this over the course of the last couple of weeks. Of course, we're going to do a formal presentation about six weeks ago, but then, of course, everything. Uh, first of all, I want you to know that uh, you know, census day was April 1st, by which we measure window to respond to the census originally was proposed July 31st. It's now been extended to October. The good news is we've got a lot more time to work with. Um, so uh, we want to absolutely work with this particularly those from what we call hard to count populations. And one idea again that Scott 
Haley and I talked about was that the district has sent out a lot of Chromebook computers to a lot of families who didn't have the computers that they're at home and they now do. It might be a good opportunity to reach out to all of them and some of their families find, which of course is very safe. And Nonetheless, uh, we want to get out of this media crisis first. So, anyway, just really wanted to get this on the radar. Uh, I'm going to answer the question now. I can, but uh, probably as we can, probably a later time. All right. Thank you very much. I don't know about others, but I had a difficult time hearing all your testimony so if you um can provide that to the board in written form that would be great i do know that we've been collaborating with the census effort and i believe that we have been um putting reminders into some of our meal just into our breakfasts and lunches that we've been distributing so uh thank you very much yeah thank you director constam that's that's basically what john and i uh talked about when we kicked around ideas is again how how to leverage all the communication we're doing with families to get the word out about the census and particularly out particularly around meal distribution if we could get census material that's translated uh, to hand out to families would be uh, would be a, a good thing to do Thanks. that's great um ms bradshaw do we have any other public comment This is Roseanne. I don't see anybody else signed up. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, Superintendent Guerrero, good evening. Would you like to provide us with your report? Good evening, directors, students, families, staff, and viewing public. I hope everyone is in good health and excellent spirits now that we are in week eight of alone together uh, and campus closures. Uh, we're fully underway with our distance learning, uh, PPS HD. Um, our daily routines have changed. Uh, we're adapting to new ones, uh, including our board regular meetings, um, uh, which seems to be the, the routine throughout our, our work days. So um, as I open my report for this evening, um, I want to continue to share appreciation for our hardworking frontline staff, uh, especially our nutrition workers, our custodial staff. Uh, they continue to work round the clock uh, to meet essential needs of, of our students and families. Uh, you see three pictures actually on the slide, uh, our nutrition workers, um, teachers and um, some of our students from previous graduation ceremonies. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about those three themes uh, tonight. Um, I'll move on to the next slide because, uh, like the board, also want to share uh, my appreciated uh, my appreciation and join you, directors, uh, in celebrating our hardworking educators. Uh, really proud to be superintendent here at PPS. Uh, we have the board's leadership, but, and we have thousands of Portlanders uh, who, who together um, have, have imagined a better future uh, for, for our children, for, for our youth. Um, and we articulated in this vision uh, these attributes for the adults that work within the school system. We called them educator essentials, uh, that every adult uh, has a role in supporting our students. Uh, it's in these educator essentials that you find, if you recall, words like innovative, caring, resilient. Uh, and in the middle of this pandemic, these particular three words uh, have taken on a whole deeper meaning. During my 25 year career, I've been an educational assistant, a classroom teacher, school and district administrator, and have experienced many challenges uh, in school systems, but confronting this particular health crisis has certainly demanded uh, a completely new level of attention and out-of-the-box thinking. And uh, 
uh, our organization and its people's ability to, to turn this disruption into a transition, a, a crisis into an opportunity, uh, what could be potential chaos into a clear focus uh, as our, our continued main focus, our students and, and families. Uh, and that's due to the flexibility and the perseverance that's been demonstrated by our educators and our school administrators. Uh, frankly, it's their thoughtfulness, their care, their innovation, their resilience. Uh, it's what's making um, this level of distance learning, essential services and supports for students possible. So today, as, as teaching and learning is taking place at kitchen tables and in living rooms, uh, coffee tables, we want to take a quick minute to, to acknowledge and celebrate our educators all week long as part of National Teacher and Administrator Appreciation Week. So uh, thank you, teachers and administrators, from your superintendent uh, for being a hashtag BPS superhero. Uh, it's another special day today. Uh, for those of us of, of Mexican heritage, uh, you'll recognize it's Cinco de Mayo. Uh, and I want to I want to call that out because last Friday, many of our schools and families also celebrated another cultural tradition, El Dia de los Niños, uh, Day of the Children, uh, also a Mexican holiday that celebrates uh, the most precious among us, our children. Uh, in fact, uh, on this day, teachers and schools across Mexico organized the day uh, around, focused on their students, uh, uh, playing games, enjoying activities and, and food. So uh, in the spirit of celebrating children, uh, staff seems to have pulled up a particular first grader there uh, yes, I wore suits to school even in the first grade. So uh, as a teacher and school principal, uh, I think it's it's always important to, to honor and recognize the, the diverse cultures and traditions uh, of the families uh, that we serve. So uh, to our children out there, uh, to all of those celebrating uh, El Dia de los Niños and Cinco de Mayo, uh, I'm also, I was also a history major. So uh, for those of you uh, uh, who, who may not be familiar with with the history of, of the 5th of May. Uh, it commemorates a particular day in history, uh, the Battle of Puebla, when a, a ragtag, scrappy Mexican army uh, in a very important battle defeated a powerful French force uh, during the Mexican War. So uh, a little history in there as well. Uh, and, and what I would say is uh, it's a story about uh, defeating the odds, uh, which is gonna transition me to, to our next slide. Um, because for during this pandemic, um, uh, we're also doing our best to, to beat the odds, uh, to come together and, and to make sure that, that we're supporting uh, our students and, and families. So uh, more on our nutrition workers, uh, they can, they've now provided a total of over 300,000 meals uh, to children in our community. Um, our technology team uh, has distributed over 15,000 tech devices, uh, over 700 families also now have connectivity to the internet uh, as well. Uh, we've had um, great partnerships with uh, businesses in the community, uh, businesses like DoorDash, uh, who have continued to put thousands of meals directly into the hands of more than 450 PPS students thus far, uh, many of whom are at high risk of getting sick. So, um, and then on the advocacy uh, route, uh, on, the, on the issue of beating the odds, uh, uh, I continue to have regular contact with my local and national counterparts uh, who are also continuing to find creative ways uh, to address and mitigate uh, these immediate and long-term challenges uh, I know that our board and, and the public is is wondering and and, and imagining what it's going to look like uh, when we begin to reopen. Uh, it'll certainly be a, a different way of, of conducting business. Uh, more on that later. Uh, but in the meantime, we're going to continue advocating to legislative bodies and other elected officials who I know share our concern that our public schools require funding, uh, relief funding in particular, as we prepare <laughs> classrooms in our school campuses uh, for the fall. So uh, in the sense of some normalcy, normalcy uh, many more uh, of our students, though, continue connecting with teachers, counselors, social workers, and other key staff uh, at a regular cadence. So uh, thank you to our professionals for continuing to maintain those connections. And part of the reason we see, next slide, more students connecting with our school staff is because how teachers and principals 
are exemplifying those educator essentials, uh, flexing their adaptive and resilient skills. So through PPS HD, they're finding countless creative ways to connect with, engage, entertain, enlighten, and educate their students. Uh, just to name some examples uh, from among our school leaders, principals like Megan McCarter, uh, making short TikTok messages, morning messages to her students. Uh, teachers who are producing creative learning videos. Uh, for example, here in the hat, you have Mr. Anderson, the automotive teacher at Benson, uh, pictured here. Uh, he tried something new. Uh, I think he says in his video, you know, how do you teach uh, automotives when it's a very hands on um, location with a creative solution uh, to continue teaching his students about motors? Uh, in his virtual auto class. So I enjoyed his lesson. Uh, he's pointing there to a tractor. Uh, he was talking about this grader and its uh, motor, uh, and I learned something new. So thank you, Mr. Anderson, Principal McCarter, and the many other educators out there who are finding new ways to engage our students in learning. So thank you. And then lastly, want to talk uh, for a moment about our financial forecast. Uh, so as our school staff is continuing to find creative ways to bring joy to our students, I, along with our senior leadership, uh, are continuing to create and find strategies to mitigate what is looking like a really sobering reality uh, and negative budgetary impact that this pandemic is having, uh, not just locally and in the state of Oregon, but certainly across the country. Uh, and in particular for Portland Public Schools as the state's largest district, uh, is, is needing to think very carefully uh, about the impact uh, of this pandemic. So uh, this evening, uh, mm -hmm. the board directors are gonna hear details of uh, our latest uh, next proposed cost saving measure. Uh, it, it, it proposes to institute furlough days across the, inst the organization. Uh, our chief of human resources officer, Sharon Reese, uh, who kudos has spearheaded this effort is going to walk the board through this proposed plan for the board's consideration, which aims to preserve funds for direct services to students in the coming school year. In this case, by leveraging some available federal resources to support both our employees and the local economy. So ultimately, I believe these kinds of actions that uh, we're continuing to share with you uh, and that we'll continue to implement um, uh, as difficult as some of the decisions may be, uh, our number one goal is to protect uh, services for our students, uh, the supports uh, that they, they very much need, uh, and the talented uh, educators uh, that we're appreciating here this evening. So uh, ultimately, we want to make sure we provide the best educational program in the coming school year. And by taking some prudent measures now, uh, we think uh, we will help to mitigate uh, some of those impacts. So uh, much more on that in, in the coming board meetings. Uh, and tonight we'll hear about an additional uh, strategy that we're proposing to the board. So um, I'm going to pause. I'm going to stop here. That ends my report for this evening. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Superintendent, and thank you for sharing your first grade photo, or or having someone else share your first grade photo. <laughs> Um, you're up next as well. Would you like to introduce this next item where we hear from some of our educators and one of our students about their experience with distance learning? Yes, yeah, so uh, we committed to continuing to provide some updates on how uh, distance learning uh, is and the experience that uh, our students are having during this campus uh, closure, and I can describe it, but what better way to hear about it than directly from uh, our clients? Um, I'm going to turn it over to our chief of schools, uh, Dr. Sean Bird, who I believe has some special guests. That's right. Good evening, uh, Chair Constant, Vice Chair Moore, Board Directors, and Superintendent. Uh, we want to. We do have some very special guests tonight that we want to uh, introduce you to. Um, but before we do that, I just want to provide a little bit of context about our distance learning update so that um, we can set the stage for our guests um, to speak. Um, so you can move to the next slide, please. Um, as you remember, about eight weeks ago, we embarked upon this uh, journey of distance learning. And when we did this, uh, we uh, did this in partnership with our labor partners. Uh, and 
uh, our uh, principles and we really just uh, laid out a framework that we would um, base this work on. So based upon the uh, executive order of the governor and, and therefore the guidance from the ODE, we really wanted to make sure that we were focusing on uh, access, equity, and inclusiveness. Because if you remember back to that first executive order, it was about keeping schools open and making sure that we were connecting uh, um, with children and making sure that we uh, maintained a connection with children as they were um, not in, able to come to school every day. We wanted to make sure that we established a spirit of collaboration with our labor partners, um, particularly because we know that they are uh, also dealing with personal circumstances at home and uh, we wanted them to connect with students, teach students, but also uh, take care of them as employees uh, and make sure that, that we were collaborating together to, to come up with a workable solution to this, to this um, different circumstance that we're in. We wanted to set expectations for uh, continuous learning opportunities. So we knew, uh, you know, you might remember back to the beginning when we thought we were only going to be closed for a couple of weeks. It was really about staying connected and um, doing social emotional kind of work. And then as the school closure uh, extended, then it was about uh, prioritizing the standards that children needed to learn so they'd be prepared for the next academic year. So we've been in continuous um, um, collaboration with our with PAT and also with our principals about how that best looks and how uh, to make sure that we're not um, harming um, children and make sure that we're, we are doing everything we can to, to keep track of where kids are and keep them engaged in uh, learning activities. Uh, ongoing support and guidance. Um, I often think of this as kind of like Apollo 13. We uh, turned around a system that was not designed for to do what we're doing right now. We uh, turned around a face-to-face -face system and uh, made it into a distance learning system in a very short period of time. So we've had to do some ongoing support for our teachers. Some of them had uh, lots of experience with Google Classroom, some of them did not. And so we needed to provide some learning and that continues on. Uh, we also wanna make sure that we are uh, extending grace to people uh, as they learn new technologies, both students and teachers are, uh, are dealing with a lot of um, issues right now. And we wanna make sure that uh, we're providing training and also understanding of people's uh, individual situations. Um, and so, that's the last one. So next slide, please. So, uh, you know, we, we worked out some expectations um, and these are listed here. Uh, we wanna make sure that teachers are in contact with students to hold, to plan uh, lessons and they can you do that in a synchronous fashion or asynchronous, but there needed to be uh, focused on the content, a core content every week. And it's different for different grade levels and it has ramped up, the, the time expectation has ramped up over time, especially for our elementary students. You can imagine those of you who have small children in kindergarten, first, second grade, uh, it would be hard perhaps for them to sit in front of a computer for extended periods of time, even for adults sometimes, as we've all experienced probably uh, Zoom fatigue um, over, over our uh, weeks here. So we needed to make sure that we were balancing what, what children could do and, um, and what was reasonable for them uh, to do. So there would be some time that they're with the teacher and then sometimes they're doing independent study. This is all of course supported by uh, work that our Office of Teaching and Learning has done through uh, um, pps.net slash student with uh, different resources for parents to access in addition to that. Um, we also have asked people uh, to um, keep track of their contacts with their students so they're ensuring that, that students are participating. We've been gathering that data and uh, we wanna make sure that we're reaching out to students who are not engaging as much as, as we would like to make sure, first of all, that they're okay and they don't need anything, any um, you know, sort of social services that we can help them with, but also to make sure that they are uh, continuing in the learning process. We've asked our principals to hold weekly staff meetings where they're doing professional development with teachers, and then teachers are participating uh, weekly in professional learning community meetings where that, that's the planning lessons with their colleagues. They are uh, you know, talking about the technologies that they're using, those, those types of things. Next slide. Next slide, please. As with any new system, there's always some opportunities for growth. I like to look at things with a growth uh, mindset. So uh, we have not had perfection in this process by any stretch of the imagination. We certainly have had some people that are natural uh, at using technology, and we've had people that have really um, gone above and beyond, as the superintendent uh, pointed out some examples of that. Um, and we are uh, working constantly to improve our process. We, when we hear from um, parents and community members of uh, frustrations of their um, um, experience, then we are addressing those as, as they come up. Um, certainly, you can imagine that uh, parents are at home uh, working, you know, taking care of their own career. 
They also on March 16th became emergency credential teachers uh, for their own students, uh, which is um, a new task for a lot of parents. So um, we had to understand that uh, parents are, are dealing with, you know, they're, jugg they're juggling a lot right now. And so particularly families that have uh, multiple children in the home to just to carve out time for and space for their kids. Um, so, you know, we, we definitely have um, gotten feedback and we've responded to that feedback as we get it. And we continue to refine this process as we go along. Um, I think definitely an area that we uh, need to continue to be uh, explicit and communicate about uh, is the ODE guidance that we receive uh, along the way. It hasn't come out all at one time because things have evolved as the school closure has extended. Um, so definitely there has been feedback from our community about grades um, and uh, the purpose of distance learning. So particularly with grades that pass and, and complete uh, concept has uh, some people have indicated that they wish that we were going to give grades or could we give grades? And so we've um, explained uh, that we're, you know, that we are in accordance with the ODE guidelines, but I think, you know, we need to continue to, uh, to provide um, that guidance. And also that that doesn't mean that education is not going on. Uh, that just means that we are giving feedback in different ways. And then the purpose of distance learning, quite frankly, has changed over the time. Uh, the purpose of, as the closure extended, it became more important that teachers um, not just review material and make social emotional connections, but they also uh, prioritize those standards that um, they are, um, that they need, that kids need to learn so they can be successful in the next grade. We have groups that are planning for next year, um, different um, strategies of how we're gonna catch uh, students up. Because if you think about the time if we do go back to school as scheduled, it will be almost six months that kids have not been in a, in a building. So there's going to be some things that we need to do. And I think probably, uh, uh, definitely not probably, definitely a challenge uh, uh, that we've experienced has been uh, refining our delivery of our special education model. Uh, there are just aspects of delivering these services to students with disabilities that are difficult in a, in a distance uh, learning environment for a variety of reasons. Uh, we have been um, working with our special educators to. Um, to help them manage the workload because they just have some federal requirements that uh, that general education teachers do not. Uh, so we've had to definitely, uh, and we are that is a work in progress. We, we continue to uh, refine that um, that process. Okay, next slide. So we're going to continue to work on those um, those challenges. Um, and as I said, we we have a work group that's planning for summer programming and really focusing on groups of students that we're particularly uh, concerned about. You know, we wanna make sure seniors get across the line. We wanna make sure that we are uh, paying close attention to students who are historically underserved, uh, African-American, uh, Black, Native American students, uh, economically disadvantaged students, students with disabilities, English learners, all of these groups of students that we typically, uh, we, we need to make sure that we are really uh, putting extra effort into. So as, um, our governor uh, issues new orders, uh, easing social distance. We'll be looking at ways we can serve those children in between now and the start of school. And so, uh, of course, you know, we have to wait until we receive new guidance for that. But we are um, we have contingency planning that's happening uh, and has been happening since since this uh, this event started. We are uh, every week I check in with my team who supervise principals and uh, I frequent uh, check ins with the PAT leadership. Um, to monitor the success of what's happening, but also to make refinements as needed. As I mentioned, we um, have been dealing with some uh, issues around special education that we needed to uh, to look at, and we have, uh, you know, refined our um, our process with with regard to that. Uh, as also, you know, we have from time to time principals will uh, qu will ask us questions about um, teachers that are struggling with technology. So we've set up help lines. We've set up things that are uh, designed to help teachers. Uh, to be able to do their job and what they need to do. And then finally, we are um, planning for a new school year. And uh, we don't know uh, what that's going to look like. Uh, none of us know yet, but um, it, there's a possibility there'll be some form of distance learning. The possibility there's some new guidance from the state government. But, you know, we are uh, learning from this first version of this process, and we're going to continue to make refinements and, uh, you know, we'll launch 2.0 if necessary. Um, and depending, you know, kind of on the evolution of what happens with therapeutic options as, as this um, disease progresses. So I just want to give you a little context before we um, start. We have some special visitors. Our first uh, visitor is Rudy Duncan. He's a third grader at Lent Elementary School. So I just want to um, see uh, Rudy and thank you, Rudy, for coming today. I just want to ask you a couple of questions about um, your experience. So why don't you just tell us how it's going? How, how, do, how are you liking 
distance learning and what um what what are some things that you're doing every day at home well i'd like first to thank all the board members for inviting me for into this meeting um and well um, thank you for being here with us so I usually start my day by doing a routine. So mm -hmm. I get up in the morning. Um, I used to set my alarm for seven thirty, but now I get, but now I, um, but now I um, don't have to set my alarm, and I usually wake up at eight thirty at the latest. Mm -hmm. And if I don't, my parents become my alarm. Great. And so, um, so, and then I eat breakfast, um, and well, and then I eat breakfast. Um, I've been, I've been, I've been able to make, um, make breakfast thanks to, um, thanks that, thanks to that I have, um, um, a lot of free time. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been able to make eggs and pancakes and stuff like that. Great. Um, and, th and then after that, I do, uh, my schoolwork from my teacher. Uh-huh. Um, like, it's like reading and writing and math or basic stuff. And do you, does your teacher go, do you go online with your teacher like we're doing right now in a video chat or how does that work? Yeah, I do that every day at 12. Every day at 12, okay. For mm -hmm. how long? How long does the, the class last? Usually to 1 o'clock, one fifteen, okay. one five. Uh-huh. Then after that, I exercise with my mother. Okay. Um, and twice a week, um, Tuesdays and Thursdays, um, I, I get to meet with my mother's colleagues, daughter um her name she's a teenager and her name is um jenny right we speak in spanish together about um our lives and interest okay and, and do you do do you do school work outside of your teacher after you meet with your teacher from 12 to 1 do you do like homework or do you do uh things on the computer does she ask you to do um, things yeah um i do khan academy okay and um and then i have and then i do special projects with my mother like the family tree uh -huh. a family tree that me and my mo mother are doing mm -hmm. um i've already learned about my grandfather's side of the family Okay. Um, I learned about slavery and reconstruction and the Great Migration and Jim Crow laws and segregation. Um, um, I also do science with my father. Uh -huh. Um, and then you, and then sometimes, um, and then I, and then I eat dinner and then yeah. I go to sleep. So you, you've been you keep yourself pretty busy. That's good. So if you had some advice for us, how could we improve? Um, what do you think we could do to improve what's happening online? Or the do you think you should spend you know more time with your teacher? Do you think you should get more? I don't think you should get more work. You're probably you sound like you're pretty busy. But how do you think we could improve this for you? I am pretty busy, especially since I had three meetings today. Yeah, <laughs> that's a lot. Um. Uh. Well, I think I, I what I miss, I really miss in school that um, playing with my friends because, and you don't get that in um, in a website like um, Google Classroom or Seesaw. Right. Um. Yeah, I would like it to be more um, interactive, and you could um, like talk to your friends more. Mm-hmm. And like have friends, like friendship is probably the one of the one of the things you need most in this time. Yeah. yeah. And I think we should make it more. And um, also we could, 
and also um, interactive also means like doing um, sun school. Like uh -huh. you could do chess, like for example, chess club. We could do like a meet, like we could get like an app or something. Yep. And um, have a meet, like a Zoom meeting. Or, mm -hmm. And then um, like use that um, app to play to play with to play chess with other players. Yep. So you like some of the after school activities that you do also, not just reading and writing and math, but some some other things that are fun and challenging too. Yeah, more connection. With connection. Okay. Dr. Right. Burr, this is uh, Superintendent Guerrero. Do you mind if I ask a question? Of course. Go ahead. Rudy, it's great to see you. Uh, it's always good to check in with you. Uh, I know that we're working with teacher Ron. Um, I, we have a challenge out to the uh, Lent Leopard Chess Club for a virtual tournament, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, but I had a question for you. I know that you're a very active learner, and I appreciate you sharing your daily routine with us, but you've also been teaching. Can you share with everybody? You posted a recent video lesson which i watched and i learned something can you tell everybody about your google classroom lesson um well yeah um a lot of people wanted um wanted to to um write down their answers to um let's say a math project but and they didn't want to type it or they didn't even know what, how to type um and um and i was and me and my mother found out a way to um go on a Goog uh, google doc and um and um send a picture put a picture um put a picture on the google doc and turn it in and um yeah and i i did just my mom, my mother did a Spanish version for people who spoke Spanish. Um, I also did a second video that um, that actually that helps that actually that fully um, tells um, the instructions. Wow. Well, fantastic. Thank you for sharing your learnings with the rest of us. Thank you so much, Rudy. All right, Rudy, thanks. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Nice to meet you. All right. So next up, we have uh, somewhat of a celebrity. She's become the TikTok uh, principal of Oregon. If you saw the news the other night, uh, Principal Megan McCarter. She's the proud principal of Scott School, and she has a teacher with her, Angela Bonilla, who teaches fourth grade uh, in the dual language immersion program. So um, I've asked them just to talk about their experiences with you, and so I'll turn it over to Megan first, and then you can introduce us to your teacher, Megan. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for having us here tonight. Um, again, kind of similarly, you can hear from me, but I think, um, you know what, Scott, the people who are really doing the hard work and the heart work every day are our teachers, and a lot of our community, a lot of our families are doing um, this really tough work and being super innovative. So um, I brought with me one of my fourth grade DLI teachers, Angela Bonilla. Um, she's really incredible. I, I'm doing a choice menu for PD with my staff and I actually got it from her. <laughs> um, so I can take no credit for it. Um, and so I think first, maybe I'll just turn it over to Angela to talk to you guys a little bit about what's happening um at the school at the classroom level and the school level and then um i can always add on or answer any additional questions you all have um so angela hello am i okay to unmute my mic or is someone supposed to unmute me yeah you're good we can hear you all right you're great, great. welcome thank you thanks um my name is angela bonilla i teach fourth grade spanish um, DLI class uh, at Scott Elementary. And um, wow, distance learning has been quite the uh, steep learning curve. It's had a very steep learning curve for us as teachers um, and for our students. And as teachers, you know, as soon as we found out on Friday that we had to head out on Friday, uh, we were stressed, but 
we kind of do what we always do, which is figure out how to make it work. So I know a lot of us packed curricula and packed worksheets and things to grade because we assumed we were coming back. And now knowing that we are going to be doing online work for the rest of the year, a lot of us have kind of changed gears very similarly to how the district has had to change gears in terms of what we offer. Um, currently, I meet with my students as a whole class twice a week for an hour. Um, and then they vote. We had a conversation because that that meeting is usually more of a circle time and a way for me to explain the choice menu that they have to, the different activities they have to do for the week um, and i asked them if they wanted something uh similar to the la to what the last speaker uh discussed like a social hour um and it had a resounding yes my said that's what we need so i let them vote on a survey what topics and what days worked and now after each team meeting as a, as a class, there's a social hour meeting um, where students just get to hang out with each other. Um, I think, you know, we were really trying to make sure we were connecting with families and connecting with students and making sure those basic needs were met. Um, but I think a lot of times we forget that a lot of what school is for kids, in addition to the learning and, and like math and reading is the relationships that it's the relationships that they get to build. Um, and a lot of them just miss their friends or they don't live somewhere where they're near anyone else that they can interact with safely. Um, so it's been a really great engagement tool. Kids are coming to the meetings because they know that there's a fun, you know, video chat afterwards. Um, I've had to learn how to mute different tabs so that I can keep an eye out on them without um, blowing out my eardrums. Uh, but for the most part, I think the social aspect for my class has been the driving force behind their engagement in distance learning. Um, when it comes to the actual work, I've been trying to track what type of work most of my kids will do. So I've been giving them activities on different platforms. 3.5 was asked to use um, Google Classroom. And for some of my kids that worked and for some it didn't. And since Scott was a tech smart school, most of my kids have experience with Seesaw. And once I started posting more assignments on Seesaw, I saw more engagement. So a lot of our work as teachers has been trying to gauge what works best for each of our kids while not being able to kind of sit with them individually and make sure we know exactly what's working for them. Um, I think the biggest struggles have been the uh, not knowing for a lot of teachers. You know, we're worried about the kids we can't contact. We're worried about our kids with uh, different needs, uh, those who are not able to access uh, different services or don't have many community supports. Um, and a lot of times those are the kids who aren't showing up to our chats or are showing up with their cameras off um, as silent participants. Uh, so I think you know, we're worried about losing some of our kids. We're worried about not being able to be that steady presence for them, but we're doing the best we can with what we've got, right? And so um, I think for me, I was one of those teachers that used Google Classroom when I taught sixth grade last year. Um, I'm pretty tech savvy, so the switch wasn't so much um, how do I do this? It was more of how do I make sure all of my kids are included all of my kids are getting access to this. Um, and, you know, luckily, well, I don't have children. And so for me, teaching from home is not as big of a hurdle as it is for some of my colleagues. Um, and so that's been another thing that we've all had to maneuver. Like, how do our home lives, how can we keep our home lives and our work lives working symbiotically? And um, it's definitely taken a toll on some of the educators I've spoken with but I think PPS and um, PAT have worked really well together in figuring out ways to reduce our workload and our expectations while making sure that we're still serving our kids. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of what we're doing as teachers. Thank you, Maestro Bonilla. Thank you so much. Okay, we also have from uh, Ockley Green, we have Christina Howard, the principal of Ockley Green, uh, and also a uh, seventh grade math teacher, Elise Hughes. So we want to give you a little perspective from the uh, middle level as well. So we'll turn it over to Christina. 
Hi, everyone. Um, I apologize if you hear a, a baby in the background. I have a one-year-old, and so I'm trying to balance that. Um, and this is a really tricky time for her, So, and she knows I'm in the other room. Um, so I just want to preface that before I speak. But uh, I'm going to do the same thing that Megan did, and just I, I do want to share our consistent community care message that we um, are putting out to all of our families and all of our staff. And I think that that's sort of the... Uh, the motto that's like guiding us and and how we're we're approaching distance learning and so i'll share that and then i'm going to turn it over to elise um so this consistent community care message that we we uh created as a staff uh goes out in like weekly communication to families it's also um part of how we um talk about students and how we're approaching this in team meetings and so um basically it's just a simple message that we would love for you to participate in it as much as you can. You and your family together determine how much can be accomplished in a day or a week. We understand the need for you to be able to do what you can. Don't worry about it. Take care of yourselves and your family. And so that's that's how we're approaching this. And so um, I'll let Elise share what she's doing. She's been doing an amazing job in leading a lot of our staff and the math team. Um, she's had a lot of experience with this uh, working in other districts, and she's brought that knowledge to Ockley and. Um, so she's she's been doing a lot of great things and getting a lot of great results. So I'll let her speak and then I'll answer any questions that you guys have. Hi guys, um, you might also hear some background noise sharing houses and trying to teach um, or meet at all. Um, so hi, I'm Elise Hughes, I'm a seventh grade math teacher um, and Christina kind of mentioned my background a little. So I've worked in districts that have been one to one. So I do have uh, a little bit of prior knowledge with this, but this is completely different than I think sharing a space with kids and then expecting them to have technology when they get home. This is completely different. This has been all about trying to keep the connection we have in our classrooms and either continuing that or growing it and just not losing it. Um, I think that's been really the hard part. So I know the district has provided a lot of resources and what that's been for me is taking those and making them accessible for my students. So um, Christina did a great job kind of setting up a schedule because in middle school, I see 130 kids. So checking in with all of those kids individually and like setting up a schedule, if we all tried to do that, we would, um, it would be a little bit chaotic. So she set up a seven period day throughout the week. So kids know when they can check in with me. So I see my classes throughout the week and then, um, and then also hold what are called office hours. So uh, the way I've kind of set it up is I've pushed out content to kids either through videos or uh, Google Forms to gauge their gauge the response. So on Mondays, it's kind of like my, hey guys, welcome to the week, um, some sort of weekly question to check in on how they're doing social emotionally and then a video from me. So like the video content, what are we learning about this week? And then I collect data essentially from that. I see the kids who have checked in um, on that day and then can instantly on Monday already start seeing who's checked in and who hasn't and start messaging them through uh, Google Classroom, email, Remind, um, and seeing what they need in order to be able to participate. And then uh, through the class seconds and office hours, I'm able to actually help answer questions. So kids can come check in and say, hey, I didn't understand and come do that. Um, I think the thing I've had the most success with, and I think Rudy kind of mentioned it was social hour, is uh, I set up a class Kahoot game. So every single week uh, we do Kahoots on Wednesday and I open it up to anyone who is my student. I actually had a kid from another school join one of these Kahoot games. So <laughs> um, apparently they're popular. Uh, so we always start with math because um, I love it and I want them to love it as much as I do. But, um, and then I always uh, choose one that they might have some more interest in. So we've been doing basketball and sports and music, and then they've been trying to create their own so that they can play um, some of their games in that as well. Um, that, that's been the most successful. And then I've actually started doing it two times a week because we're getting a lot of kids in that space. Um, we had lunch clubs running before, and now we have a bunch of teachers who have started lunch clubs back up or are holding recess for their students because it really is about how do we get these kids online. Uh, we pretty much go off of a touch point document, which is essentially an attendance sheet, and look at which kids we've communicated with. Uh, was it like communication via Google Classroom, or was it 
they've actually turned something in or are they doing both? Are they showing up to Google Meets? And that's been a really good way for our staff and support team to see which kids are needing support, which kids are kind of falling off um, because the distance learning is hard and we're trying to make it as flexible for them as possible. Uh, I think the most that I feel like a teacher is when I do those Google Hoop games or when they show up to class, but I recognize that not all kids can and just trying to make it as accessible for them outside of that. So making myself as available online for them to find information, whether that's Google Classroom or YouTube or setting them up on uh, our distance learning like website hub so they can find us um, has been pretty, uh, pretty impactful for my kids. Uh, looking at last week's data, I had 84% of my kids attending, which either means either communication turned in assignments or um, both of those things. And recognizing that still 16% of my kids I'm not seeing. And I know that that could be they don't like math, it, but you know, um, uh, and are checking in at other places, but still for right now, it feels really impactful. And then it gives me an idea of who I can touch point with this week to try and get them connected. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if I can ask just a question. Um, so just given this model and it's going to play out through the um, end of the year, first of all, thank you for everything you're doing under challenging circumstances and to all the other teachers and staff. Um, I'm curious about your thinking about, um, you know, when we uh, re return to the classroom, um, kind of your thoughts on you're as a teacher working with individual students, how do we sort of make up that time period or what's, um, What's the most effective way that you would see we could um, do that, especially with kids who are struggling beforehand? So I don't know if, if that was directed to me. It I can answer yes. piece of it. Okay. Um, so I'm also I also uh, am the professional learning community com community lead. So we we work as a math department to kind of look at that. So since distance learning has started, we we looked at programs to set up to make it so that kids want to engage. But really our focus has shifted to what standards are kids actually going to be missing and how, how can we support these standards in what we're doing now and then moving into next year. So we're already like our meetings tomorrow is all looking at the priority standards laid out for next year. What should kids be coming into um, each grade with and, and what are they going to be missing and how can we, how can we boost them up so that they aren't going to be missing those skills. It, weirdly, in this time, I have connected with more of my students um, who are struggling math students because there there's like no stigma against not learning math. So I have students who used to be afraid to answer questions, be able to send me a private video of them doing math and me be able to send a private response to them where I used to get nothing. Um, so I know that that's a little off topic, but uh, really looking at the standards and trying to start planning is what our math PLC is working on right now. We spend, we spend an hour a week, if not more, talking about that very thing. So I don't have a final answer, but prioritizing the standards and looking at what the holes are has really been our focus. That's great to hear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I um, sort of build up something that you said? Um, I was at a meeting last week, including representatives from a bunch of other, from PPS plus a, a lot of the local school districts. Um, and it was uh, people who mostly focus on uh, student support services. And um, we were all sort of checking in on how things are going with students. And one of the comments I heard was that um, some of the students who had uh, the most difficulty um, keeping engaged in the regular classroom are actually finding some benefit to the distance learning, um, sort of what you were talking about, that they're, um, for, for some of these kids, they're, they're feeling more connected to school now than they did before um, academically. Um, and I don't think anybody is suggesting that online learning 
will ever be a substitute, but there might be some lessons to be learned about how to um, integrate different techniques with um, with students so that um, you know we can um, we can differentiate the instructional models um, a, a little bit more with with students um, even post COVID. I. I would love to uh, agree with that because that's one of the things I've seen. Just having video, like just having technology for these kids to access has been huge. A video of me teaching something where, I mean, you're not building that connection, but students can pause me. They can make me go faster or slower in the video. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many different platforms out there that give students instant feedback on their learning. It is something that I think teachers are able to learn a lot about and how to incorporate this into next year, whatever next year looks like, regardless if we're all online or all in classrooms, having these tools and like being gently nudged to use them has been super, super helpful. I think I can think of a handful, if not more of kids who have really felt like they've been more successful in this environment and like parents have reached out saying that they have seen their kids anxiety and like stress around school dramatically reduced. And I know this isn't the case for a lot of kids. I, I, our kids need the social time. And I don't think distance learning is for everyone. But I think we as a community of educators can definitely learn from distance learning and bring this back in, yeah, so many ways. I'd be curious, um, as this goes on, I'd be curious to hear if there's any way that um, that you can capture you collectively can capture kind of what proportion of kids are having real difficulty um, kind of engaging with these new methods versus how many are just kind of bumbling along and then you know what proportion of kids are are really um, kind of thriving um, or, or reacting positively to, to the kind of distance learning stuff. Um, because it might be, I think it'd be really fascinating to, to see how that would play out in terms of how different kids respond. I could say, Lee, I have a question for Ms. Bonilla. Um, I was just wondering, you, I think you mentioned that you taught an older grade before and now you are teaching a younger grade, is that correct? Yes. So have you noticed like as um, just having had experience with the older grade, how have you felt like this, the younger grades have um, adapted to this with their social emotional needs? Um, I think that's a great question. I feel like for um, the fourth graders that I work with, it's definite, they've been together for so long, you know, by fourth grade, they are family. And so a lot of times they just want to have that interaction with each other. Um, I think in terms of uh, this distance learning and how it's affecting their social emotional life, there's, there's definitely kiddos that started being engaged and then other services finally clicked and so they no longer need me and they don't come online and they do the the paper packet um so i think as long as those other systems are still in place a lot of our kids are getting served but i do know that there are several kids in that k5 range who come to school to get a break from home and aren't receiving that especially our kiddos who have lots of children in the house um several children in the house, excuse me, uh, who might all be doing distance learning at the same time. Uh, I, I've noticed that a few of those students are having um, some behavioral needs. I was on a phone call with a parent for an hour and a half yesterday, trying to support her in how to support her son in doing the work and also behavior management because she's usually working and he's usually with me five days a week. So I think there are different needs popping up, just like our older kids are getting, you know, some of the kids are benefiting from not having to give answers right on the spot, being able to process a little bit longer, being able to show their learning in different ways. But I think there are other kids who this is bringing up different types of stressors um, that families aren't necessarily equipped to deal with. 
I hope that answered your question. Totally. And it made me think of what an awesome teacher you are because you're like, their needs are getting met, so they're disengaging. And I my I would probably affirm that is they're getting overwhelmed, they're disengaging. So uh your sort of willingness to do this work in such a beautiful way shine through in your answer. So thank you for the amazing teacher you are and for the grace and um connection you offer to your students. Thank you. I would say thank you to all of our principals and teachers and, and Rudy for joining us tonight. Um, Chief Bird, I don't know if you have anything more that you wanted to share with the board, but it's been so important for us to hear your insights and your challenges and just what your day-to-day -day, um, is like. And this, you're all just the picture of adaptability because everyone's finding their way. And just to hear the stories about, you know, how, how do we make sure we're connecting with each of our students and figuring out, you know, how this is all landing on them is just so beautiful. So thank you all for being here and for everything you do every day. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, that was pretty inspiring. Um, okay, back to our good. board, excuse me? That was a really interesting discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, back to our board uh, business, just a moment. The next item on the um, agenda is looking at our revised 2020-2021 budget calendar. Um, Superintendent, would you like to provide some background on this item? Superintendent, would you like Deputy Superintendent Claire Hertz to um, provide some background on this item? You just took the words that I said with the mute button on, so thank you, <laughs> Deputy Superintendent. <laughs> Welcome, Deputy Superintendent. Thank you. Good evening. Um, you have before you an uh, amended uh, Budget calendar for 2020-21 pro budget process. Uh, as you are aware, our local economy, state economy, national economy is seeing an impact from the um, COVID um, pandemic. And so because of that, uh, we are expecting a May 20th economic forecast and that will give us up-to-date information on what to expect for funding for next year. And we are going to bring our proposed budget to you after that forecast. So that means we're moving it out to the end of May. And then we will have a, a shortened um, process with um, three meetings to uh, complete our budget process as an abbreviated process, still providing two opportunities for community engagement um, at those um, meetings for testimony. But understanding that our um, governor may call the um, legislature into special session to reallocate resources for next year. So even by statute, we must complete our budget process by June 30th. And so we are gonna keep going forward with our current funding level in, in a proposed budget. And we'll be bringing that forward and we'll also work on um, tiered reductions to present to the board at time at the time that we understand what our funding level will be. So because all of this is changing so rapidly, we didn't feel it was wise to bring this forward until after that May economic forecast. So we have built our calendar for an abbreviated process um, and bring that to you for approval tonight. Amy, Here. you're muted. Excuse me, rookie move. Thank you, De Deputy Superintendent Hertz. And we'll get this resolution on the table and see what board discussion we have. The board will now vote on resolution 6108 to amend the 2020-2021 budget calendar aligned with Portland Public Schools reimagined students, the Student Success Act and our multi-year business plan. Do I have a motion? So moved. 
Director Bailey moves and do I have a second? I'm sorry, who was that? That was Julia from Edwards. And Director Brim Edwards seconds the motion to adopt resolution 6108. Ms. Bradshaw, is there any public comment on 6108? No. All right, is there any board discussion? Yes, I have a question just about um, the, um, I'm looking at the budget calendar. Um, I, maybe this is either um, Stephanie Soden or David Roy or Jonathan Garcia, but where um, we have a super tight um, time frame between the proposed budget on the on May 26th, it being rolled out and then voting sometime the week of the, the ninth on approval. And I know in the past, our budget hearings have been um, lightly attended, um, but in years in which um, I think like years like this in which um, we're not going to be additive that I would anticipate a lot more um, interest in the community engaging and then just the whole challenges of potentially doing that in a virtual environment. So I'm um, would be interested in knowing where um, and how that will be set um, in terms of you know, getting input between the 26th of May and the week of June 9th when we're gonna approve the budget. Hey, Director Brim Edwards, this is Jonathan uh, Garcia, Chief Engagement Officer. Uh, so we are still working out those details pending the uh, board approval tonight. Uh, we have a meeting scheduled tomorrow to discuss kind of the game plan for how we uh, will partake in community engagement. I can tell you that our engagement team has been working around the clock um, to, to really figure out how does engagement look like in this new uh, reality. Um, they've been working and meeting with or be participating actually in, in webinars with uh, uh, folks like Dr. Karen Maps, who is the kind of premier um, expert on family and community engagement. Uh, and, and so I know that they have been uh, bringing in a lot of that learning. Um, and so again, we, we plan to talk about it tomorrow and, and really uh, design the game plan uh, to, to make sure that we get uh, our families um, connected to this conversation, uh, and especially our communities who are uh, frontline and, and, and our communities of color. So we'll know more uh, in the next few days. Um, Director Lowry, do you have anything you want to say about the um, uh, community budget review committee meeting this past week and the discussion that you all had about a revised um, budget calendar? Unfortunately, I had to miss some of that conversation because I had to be in an executive session with uh, the, the rest of you, um, board members. Uh, but I know that the CBRC continues to discuss um, how they can feel like their uh, perspective is heard. Um, and I know that we are um, you know, in process for them to have that short turnaround time to really review the budget. Um, and I know that um, Cynthia Lee, who works with them, and Deputy Superintendent Hurts did a really great job of grounding um, the team in sort of the, the bigger goals and the values of the district as sort of the baseline for how those decisions will be made. It will be a very different year and a different CBRC process, but grounding in those values as they take a lens to look at the, the budget will happen. And um, there continues to be, you know, conversation about the role of CBRC. And as a reminder, you know, we as the board at any time can task CBRC with looking at specific provisions of the budget for us um, through that lens of our um, district values. So they're that resource and tool to be used, not just in the annual budgeting process, but throughout the year as we see fit. Thank you. Um, do we have any further uh, board discussion or questions? Yeah, I guess it's um, just a follow up with, oh, go ahead. Well, I had a question. Um, about uh, kind of what we can expect uh, in terms of uh, a, a realistic discussion of the budget um, going forward. Um, so if the if the um, revenue projection doesn't come out until May twentieth, and six days later we're going to be hearing about the PPS budget, um, I, I can't imagine that 
no matter what they say on the 20th, there's going to be enough time to actually make any substantive changes to the budget. So, so am I correct in assuming that we're going to be seeing the budget that you prepared um, working on life as it existed two months ago? Yes, you'll be seeing a uh, state school funding level at 9.0 billion, which is what was appropriated by the state for 2019 to 21 biennium. So we are bringing that forward as well as full funding for the student investment account and full funding for measure 98. What we know is that we won't have enough revenue to support all of that, but until, until we have more information about what that will be, we have we had already prepared this budget as this um, event broke, and we were just getting ready to put it to print. So you actually will be receiving that next week in in the U.S. mail. It will come to all of you, um, both the proposed budget document as well as the individual school reports. Now they. Um, both so we and we will post those also on the web so that people have them way ahead of time to review before the meeting but in all reality we know that our funding is in question in various um types of funding is in question and so what we'll have to do is um whether or not the legislature is done with their work we'll still have to adopt a budget by june 30th we need to make sure we have uh, our appropriations made and our tax levies approved in order for us to be in business July 1. So um, we will wait patiently for their process and, and be listening carefully to what we hear from Salem, but we will continue to bring forward the funding level that we know that we received reports from, from Oregon Department of Education until we hear um, otherwise. So again, um, we are uh, already working internally on um, and, and we'll be going through a process of tiers of reduction. But until we have the economic forecast, we we don't know exactly what we should be bringing forward in as reductions, but we will be sharing that um, at the most opportune time in this process when we have enough information to share what the level of reduction should be. So can I just so the, uh, uh, can I just follow up? Um, so, um, and this sort of links in with what uh, Jonathan was just talking about with community engagement. Um, so I think the budget um, timeline for next year is actually going to extend well into the summer. Um, so what will, what will happen is we'll have official actions, but we'll have an amended budget. You know, if the, so if the legislature is, is still working on it in July and, and we are, um, we'll have to at one point start staffing in time to have school open in, at the end of August. But we will um, be bringing an updated budget uh, to the board and an amended budget after July 1, once we know the full funding um, level. So are we, um, since you're gonna have to be kind of making changes on the fly. Mm -hmm. um, are we contemplating having any kind of community engagement process as you make these adjustments? Or is it is the timing just going to be um, sort it's of impossible very, to it's very tight timing. When we get to July and um, wanting to staff our schools and have them ready, it, it will be a very tight timeline. So I think it's best that we get our input during the end of May to the end of June so that we know what people, um, you know, so we can hear from our community and then we um, continue, we'll have to continue to modify at, as we hear more information from the state. From the and Director Moore, this is Jonathan Garcia. Just uh, to chime in here, I um, agree with uh, uh, Deputy Superintendent Kurtz, um, I think what we need to, to be clear on with our community is, is this shortened timeline, right? And so I think as soon as the board, if the board approves this uh, new timeline, you know, we'll work with David Roy and our communications staff to make sure that our community understands the tightened timeline 
uh, and and really begins to uh, find ways to engage in, in conversation with us. So uh, again, we're meeting tomorrow uh, afternoon uh, as a team to really begin designing what uh, community engagement is going to look like, not only for one day, not only for two days, but ongoing, knowing that we have virtual tools in our disposal to, to make that happen. So I just want to make sure that I understand um, we're going to get um, in the mail and delivered the budget that was based on the appropriation that was previously passed. We know in um, the May forecast, um, there is going to be a significant revenue drop. And then on the 26th, we're going to have this life before budget, along with a series of potential um, reductions. And that is um, what the community and the board will be looking at these sort of this one document overlaid the other document. Mm -hmm. um, so having been in this and then my, my sense is it'll go, there'll be iteration, the series of those. Um, if 2002 is any guide where there was a whole host of uh, legislative sessions or special sessions. Um, so as we think about it, even though the timeline is really condensed, we know it's going to be really condensed now. Um, the budget cuts are really, I think as we all know, are going to be really hard for this community. Um, we should just try and maximize the community input. That doesn't mean that people are necessarily are going to agree um, with us, but to having the time to, sh you know, share their grief over losses, um, I think is really important and for us to get a sense of the community's priorities. So however, it gets that community engagements get structured. Um, Jonathan, I hope that we, even though we know we have, we have a short period of time, that we really try and maximize the input because I don't think this is going to be one of these years where everybody says, yeah, we're good with everything. Um, it's just um, in some ways, people sometimes have to share a sense of loss. And I think um, we're going to need to do that on an accelerated basis. Um, and that's going to be hard for staff, the board, and the community. but should really try so the sooner we have more information the better i think that transparent and communicate often i appreciate that uh director bryn medwards and and we'll uh circle back to the board of ed to make sure that our design for our engagement uh is um is is worthy of you know making sure making sure that our community has adequate ways to to engage in, in meaningful dialogue with us uh, even if it is virtual. So uh, we'll circle back with all of you to make sure that that's uh, meeting the, the needs of our community during this time. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think um, one thing we can do in the outreach process is present a range of potential cuts, you know, A, B, and C, and, talk, and, and get a sense of the prioritization for um, if we had to cut this much, if we had to cut that much, if we had to cut a third much. And that can guide us going forward when things are changing, um, maybe for the better, maybe for the worse. Uh, and again, a lot of this depends on if Congress does something to backstop education across the country. Um, that might soften the flow a bit. Uh, but if we have that range of options and get feedback from the community that can help us uh, on a pretty short notice in our, our direction going forward. Definitely. Uh, Director Bailey and, and, and uh, so, you know, and, and as part of, as, as we design uh, these engagement sessions or engagement opportunities, if you will, you know, I think part of, uh, as, as you and I have talked about, Director Bailey, you know, part of part of this work is is really making sure that we're upfront with our community about, you know, about what what is happening, right? So, so we know we're walking into a, a, a deficit budget, right? So, so coming into the conversation with, hey, we have limited resources, so how are we going to, uh, you know, bring ourselves collectively you know, through a, a, a res J lens, through our visioning process, through our vision to make sure that, that you know, we come out of this budget uh, conversation 
uh, you know, again, not fully uh, realized because, again, we have a, 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 a cuts budget, but making sure that we can move forward together. So, so you know, I'll work with all of you to, to make sure that, that, that we're able to do that. Um, Jonathan, I'd like to just uh, give my uh, offer my two cents, and that's that um, one of the presenters, guest presenters uh, this evening talked about using cahoots. And um, I've found that when uh, talking with the public about uh, sorry, difficult conversations around budget is to use cahoots because that allows, and I don't know how well it interfaces with uh, Zoom, for instance, but it allows. Um, community members to get a visual picture of what other community members are thinking and that can be a very powerful tool um and you know everybody in the audience gets a dollar a virtual dollar and it's not going to stretch far enough to meet the needs of the district and you allow people to vote on a, a menu of options um with that dollar and using cahoots or some other um voting platform allows everyone else to see Kind of what everyone else is thinking. It's a great way to incorporate a um, RS uh, RESJ lens, um, and in a visual in a visual sense. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Director DePass. I, the the uh, you know as, as we as we're designing this engagement strategy, I mean, I think you know part of the the or the number one question that is going to be in front of us is how do we lean in on uh, our ResJ, our commitment to ResJ, right? To racial equity and social justice in this virtual reality, in this virtual uh, uh, new norm. And so, uh, you know, that's what I think I'm interested in is, is making sure that the folks that, you know, are farthest from being able to connect with us are able to. So, uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to think about creative ways, you know, that may not involve online, uh, you know, engagement, you know, so, so again, I think part of, part of what you're hearing from me and, and from, uh, our deputy superintendent is that uh, we're still waiting for direction from the state in order to to really define or design uh, what we have uh, to do in the next few few weeks. So uh, again, we'll circle back with all of you to make sure that that it meets um, you know our community's um, um, need. So if I could just add there, um, listening to everyone's questions and we, we share the concern. Um, what's different this budget development cycle from most years is uh, there's not going to be a lot of resources uh, to contend with or to have discretionary conversations about um, uh, beyond sort of trying to preserve some, some core functions and a few prioritized strategies. What's different this year is Last year, we didn't have a community-driven vision defined. Uh, we didn't have an outlined set of prioritized shifts in there that we said we were committed to. Um, and so our starting point is, is that document and what strategies can we afford to make those shifts a reality? And so our conversation, which continues in the coming work week, which also includes school leaders, is, is exactly what Director Bailey just mentioned. You know, how do we tier the resources we do have available uh, as we make some of these difficult decisions? Um, but we're, we're not going into this exercise without an idea uh, of, of some of the areas for, for investment. And we can't wait till the late summer to make decisions about some of these areas particularly the ones that involve some critical staffing um, because folks aren't sitting around waiting to see if we'll call them or we'll need them. Um, so it, it's going to be a, a rapidly evolving process that's truncated further where I think you're hearing we want to afford opportunities for community members to, to weigh in and understand and learn and be educated about what we're proposing. Uh, should be the areas that, that we invest in that won't uh, let us as an organization lose ground uh, as we head into a really difficult, I want to underline that, really difficult uh, coming school year from a financial perspective. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment, I believe. Uh, Superintendent and Director Garcia, I want to say um, I'm not as pessimistic as you are. I'm confident that Congress will show the American people the 
they value public education and local and state government services just as much as they value large corporations and large banks. From that, your mouth to the great, ears. that is a great segue to some of our business later in the evening, Director Bailey. And with that, I think we will um, move the conversation on. Are there any other questions or comments regarding the budget calendar? All right, the board will now vote on resolution 6108. All in favor, please indicate by saying yes. 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 All opposed, please indicate by saying no. Any abstentions? All right, resolution 6108 is approved by a vote of seven to zero with student representative lateral voting. Yes. Thank you. How does the cat vote? She's not with me right now. She's probably somewhere else in my house getting cuddles. But Ailey's cat, I'm sure, votes yes. <laughs> All right, continuing on with our conversation around um, budget issues, we've had a fair bit of communication with our employee groups and with our parents and community this week about um, a proposal for some budget savings. So, uh, Superintendent Guerrero, would you like to introduce this item? Um, well, before we talk about um, some of the, yeah, we're going to talk about that in an embedded way here. We're pulling up, a, here we go, a presentation, which I think dovetails nicely with the conversation uh, we were just having. So, uh, and we're going to update the board about um, recent actions up, up until the hour before the school meeting board meeting started. So. We wanted to spend some time, and I know board leadership sort of uh, really encouraged us um, to sort of begin to paint uh, the scenario uh, for us. Um, we may not have uh, an accuracy in the numbers or, or resources available to us as a school system, but I do think it's important to spend time reiterating um, some of the priorities uh, and some of the cost saving measures that are within our uh, influence that, that we can preserve for a better day next year. Um, so we wanted to spend tonight uh, spending some time on describing some of these budget strategies. Uh, you'll notice they're preserving district priorities because uh, that's that's how we see this uh, predicament that, that we're in. So next slide. Um, I'll remind us um, not, to, not to depress us, but just to remind us uh, that just a short time ago, two months ago, uh, we were singing a very different song. Uh, it was a very scenario. It was a very different scenario that we're, we were in. We felt uh, pretty healthy about our general funds, uh, a continuing to grow reserve. Uh, the voters were good to us once again with a resounding approval of an option tax, which covers uh, hundreds of adults providing direct service to our students. We were hearing about full funding for Measure 98 continuing, which provides uh, important high school supports. Uh, our district uh, quickly geared up and in a matter of months and community engagement process and uh, well-balanced thinking, I think, submitted uh, early uh, its student investment account application for the full 39 million that were being made available to us. Uh, we felt good about the package there. Um, we were talking about uh, what should appear in the fall, potentially uh, as a bond to the voters. And uh, let's have a conversation about how we continue to prioritize safety, security, and have conversations with our communities about modernizations. And you just learned about uh, another surprise, a bit of additional revenue. Uh, I won't say it was a surprise because it was calculated. Um, and that's the latest bond sale, which uh, is, is going to provide some much needed additional revenue into our ongoing capital project. So that was a little bit of the scenario uh, just a couple of months ago. We were in a really great place. Uh, the leadership team was full throttle on its work with the multi-year strategic plan uh, in this context. Um, that's where we were. And then, and, and just to remind us a little bit about the work that was contemplated with some of these additional resources, because uh, I think it's important to understand some of those elements because we have to make decisions 
about what of those elements we're going to prioritize if we don't have full funding in some of these revenue sources. So, uh, for instance, next slide, Measure 98, just to go a little further on this high school student success plan, which which has been presented, um, you know, that provides about $11 million uh, in a few key areas. Uh, it's permitted our high school secondary educators uh, to invest in uh, culturally sustaining pedagogy and curriculum, interdisciplinary work, project-based work. Uh, there was uh, some great conversations that continue to be ongoing about our own system alignment and responsiveness to local industry, post-secondary planning with our students, uh, partnering with our communities of color, uh, really articulating that range and continuum of options for, for our students. Uh, contemplated in, in this work uh, is continuing to, to focus on fostering those healthy and equitable school climate and culture initiatives, those social, emotional core programs, uh, those culturally specific mental health uh, supports, those positive behavior intervention um, elements. Uh, and then a big focus of Measure 98, as you know, is to really enhance and push forward enhanced uh, career technical education. Uh, the quality and the integration of that with core academics. Uh, you saw our matrix about how we were continuing to develop pathways, uh, how we're integrating those CTE and work-based learning programs, uh, especially now into some of our core academic classes uh, at high schools. And we were also thinking about how to develop those processes for recruiting, certifying, and retaining the CTE teachers uh, themselves in, in many of these programs, um, all of which with the goal of really preparing our students for post-secondary success. Uh, so thinking forward, but also supporting our students now. So what kind of, kind of college and career level coursework uh, access that we were increasing, uh, the enrollment that we were growing through awareness uh, in our campaign, uh, making sure that all of our students have access to, to that type of engaging uh, coursework. We were aligning our credit recovery options across the system, uh, understanding that our students have very different needs and very different goals and, and aspirations. So that's just the range of Measure 98 activity. Uh, next slide. We spent quite a bit of time with the board talking through our student investment account uh, elements as well, which was projected at 39 million to remind us there was uh, a whole bunch of activity that we were proposing, uh, academic supports and targeted interventions, especially for our students uh, not yet exhibiting uh, equitable outcomes, uh, social, emotional, mental, behavioral health supports, which we believe are gonna be in particularly important as we reopen. Uh, there was uh, an outlined investment in there to think about more optimal student-teacher ratios uh, accomplished through reduction, continued reduction of class sizes. Uh, we wanted to make sure kids had more uh, opportunity to a greater range of electives, especially in our comprehensive middle schools. Uh, we are continuing to push out our arts education pathways. We don't want our students to have to make difficult choices and, and make sure that they have full access no matter what middle grades uh, uh, school that they're attending. Uh, and we talked a lot about those culturally specific student and family supports as well. Uh, we have an RFP out now, as a matter of fact, uh, where our partners are contemplating how they draft in and support uh, our shared goals as well. And we were going to make uh, an installment of investment in some sorely needed curriculum materials and, and the accompanying PD for our educators. So this this was going to be a really big push for us. I hate to talk in the past tense because, uh, like Director Bailey, want to be more optimistic. Uh, but I just want to remind us uh, there's thinking uh, that that has gone into the road uh, that we want to travel uh, moving forward. Um, and then bringing us to current day on the next slide, uh, we've had to shift uh, some of that planning into gearing up to the current situation that we're in, uh, addressing this pandemic, uh, which, you know, from a hierarchy uh, of need, uh, really focused on supporting our students. So switching up our delivery model, uh, continuing to evolve, it's not perfect. Uh, there are some frustrations, it's not enough. Uh, and yet you heard tonight some testimony about uh, the splendid job that a lot of our educators, a very thoughtful job that our educators are doing, attempting to engage and maintain some continuity of learning 
uh, all of this in response to, to the executive order that districts were issued. Um, curriculum is continuing to be made available, whether it's online or for pickup and hard copy. We are particularly concerned about our seniors. I know we all share making sure that uh, every one of them possible uh, walks across the stage, even if that's virtual. Uh, so we are case managing them carefully. Uh, we have some, some particularly uh, uh, specialized uh, student groups, uh, students with disabilities, migrant ed students, Indian ed students, uh, all of whom we want to uh, think of, uh, continue to struggle with sort of what are some creative ways that we can continue to outreach and support uh, them. And also as an organization, we needed to create the access of so technology. You've, you've heard uh, in our updates that growing number uh, and at this point are starting to feel like we're starting to reach um, uh, the meeting of the need, uh, whether it's hardware or internet access. And, and of course, our, our students uh, continuing to have access to meals uh, is something we're continuing to be committed to. And of course, in this pandemic, our first responders need support with childcare and we're continuing uh, to provide that as well. So uh, that, that has really um, captured our attention and, and our energy uh, during current day. Um, but now we're going to bring, continue the conversation about where we are now um, and some of the continued uh, cost saving measures that uh, we're taking uh, to try to preserve precious resources. So I'm going to turn the next few slides over to Deputy Superintendent Hertz. Good evening again. So one um, thing that the state school fund budget is at a appropriated at $9 billion for two years from 2019 to 2021. And it's 38% of this um, state's budget. So one thing that we hear in the news media is when we have so many billion dollar shortfall at the state level. So one thing that's just for us to keep in mind for every billion dollar loss in state revenue, in their general fund, it equates to $30 million lost in um, state school fund for 2021. So for a billion dollar loss at the state, we would lose $30 million at um, for the 2020-21 school year. And so another thing to consider is that our Budget is 80% is people. Um, when um, we look at making reductions, um, by the time you're paying for electricity and keeping the buildings warm and the technology running, the internet access, all those kinds of things, and just some minute, you know, the repairs that we need to do um, to keep our uh, in keeping our um, schools clean and uh, just operating on a daily basis, keeping our buses running. There is very little left, but um, personnel to make reductions. So um, this is a magnitude of a budget shortfall that um, will require significant reductions in our system and will, and will impact the classroom. We're gonna do our best to minimize that impact, but recognize that the shortfall is large enough that it will have an impact on many of our um, services that we provide um, students. Moving on to the next slide. So what we have focused on in this spring, as soon as we knew this was happening, we put some um, cost saving measures in place. We um, froze purchasing and uh, we also did hiring freeze for this year and next year, pending waiting to hear more about where our funding level is. We have scaled back on um, year long contracts and we have banned travel. So um, <clears throat> we are working, we expect to take drastic measures for this fall. Um, this helps us reduce them, but doesn't eliminate them. We have an opportunity to preserve resources in the millions for next year. And with this, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Chief Human Resource Officer, Sharon Reed. Next slide, please.
Good evening, Sharon. Are yes. you with us? We can't hear you. I don't know if you can hear us. Can anybody hear me? We can yeah. now. <clears throat> Are you there now? Hello? Yes. Can you hear me? We can now. Yes. Okay. Excellent. I think I was muted remotely there. So uh, good evening, Sharon Reese, Chief of HR. So tonight we are asking the board to vote to approve our next cost cutting measure, which is a partial furlough to begin this week through the end of July in order to preserve resources to use next school year. And we believe that a day of in-person and on-campus instruction next year is more valuable and of the most value to our most underserved students, particularly viewed with a Res J lens, than a day of distance learning is in this school year. At no time has that been more true when we hopefully return our students to our schools this fall after the longest campus closures in the 150 year history of Portland Public Schools. So a couple of basics uh, before I talk about what's sitting on this slide. <clears throat> First, as uh, Deputy Superintendent Hertz mentioned, over 80% of our budget goes to salary and benefits. So in the, in the face of a cratering budget, we need to look at every cost savings lever that we have <clears throat> because that's how uh, that budget is how we're going to fund our mission and our vision. Second, we have a really unique, in fact, an unprecedented opportunity to access federal stimulus money right now through the Federal CARES Act. Uh, unlike in normal conditions, we uh, have this opportunity through the Oregon WorkShare program to access Federal CARES Act money, where we can simultaneously reduce employee hours to save the district money and bring that federal stimulus money into our local community through our employees. And third, all five of our unions have reviewed this opportunity with us and agreed that it was the right thing to do for our students in our district. And they are willing to engage in this unique experiment with us because we truly are stronger together. So we heard just before uh, this board meeting that our teachers union, uh, Portland Association of Teachers uh, uh, voted yes uh, to move forward with this plan. So you see on the slide, uh, that what we're uh, proposing is that the district close every Friday through the end of July for students. What that would mean is that home-based distance learning would continue Monday through Thursday uh, and be closed on Friday, and that we add three inclement weather days, which are currently scheduled June 8th, 9th, and 10th for student instruction. For families and staff, that would mean that district offices are open Monday through Thursday through the end of the school year and most of the summer and close on Friday. Uh, you might be familiar that uh, oftentimes our court system does a very similar uh, model in uh, budget strained years. Uh, for our district budget and for our state, uh, those federal funds that are available through the CARES Act uh, come back to Oregon taxpayers and the state economy right now. The CARES Act money that we are, are attempting to access here uh, is available through July 31st, so it's a very short window of opportunity. And uh, of course, this preserves about 20% of district salary costs now for use in, uh, in 2021. So uh, while we're talking about, can I go, can we go to the next so while we're talking about financials, uh, every financial decision and every decision we make, as you've heard throughout this presentation, we must put our students and our students and our vision, PPS Reimagined, as our guiding North Star. So a key component 
of this furlough plan through the Oregon WorkShare program is to leverage those three inclement weather days built into our school year. Uh, with doing that, uh, we lose five Fridays, but we add, uh, we extend the school year one week into the summer and we add those three instruction days back. So we do have a net loss of two instructional days, but the advantage of extending our contact uh, with students one more week into this school year. So um, the list we anticipate, and while we're still working on implementation, uh, we do expect to realize an excess of $10 million over the course of the next three months uh, from taking this action. So uh, all of this, of course, is to preserve resources now to lift the 2020-21 school year, and it is action that we can take now. We don't have to wait for fe further federal stimulus their state uh, budget forecasts uh, or anything else in the weeks and months ahead, we can um, uh, take advantage of this really unusual, unprecedented opportunity right now. Uh, before I take questions, I, I will give a couple of notes. Uh, questions have come to me about our senior leaders participating, and the answer is yes. Uh, from our superintendent to all of our senior leaders that you've heard from this evening, uh, to all of our principals and every employee in the district. There are some exceptions for those who can't participate in this uh, under the Oregon WorkShare requirements. That's almost, that, that's mostly uh, employees who have been working full-time less than six months or uh, part-time less than 12 months and people who are on leaves of absence. Uh, but barring those and a couple of other uh, small exceptions, everybody, every employee in the district would be participating in this. I'm going to uh, pause to take any questions that you okay. might have. I think we will introduce the resolution and get the item on the table and then see what questions and discussion follow. Um, Excellent. The board will now vote on resolution number 6109, approving a 20% furlough through July of 2020 and modifying the 2019-2020 school calendar. Do I have a motion? So moved. <clears throat> Director Bailey moves and a second. Do second. I have a second. Second. This is Rita. Uh, Director Bailey moves and Director Moore seconds the motion to adopt resolution 6109. Ms. Bradshaw, is there any public comment on resolution 6109? No. Okay, thank you very much. Um, all right, now to um, any board discussion or questions. Thank you, Sharon, for that um, thorough analysis. And this is not the first time we've had this conversation as we were contemplating it, but now we know that um, all, of our in, all of our employee groups have endorsed this strategy. Um, so uh, one I wanna say, Thank you, Sharon, and your team. Thanks to our labor partners. Uh, this is exactly what the CARES Act is for, which is if any organization is facing a revenue shortfall, this will help fill the gap. Uh, my question um, is, does the extra uh, three furlough days um, and how will all this, I guess, impact uh, provision of meals to families? That's an excellent uh, question, uh, Director Bailey. The, um, right now, our nutrition services hubs, which have provided over 300,000 meals uh, in the um, eighth week, by the eighth week of our closure, uh, are uh, serving meals on Friday. Uh, to uh, cover weekends uh, for those families. And we would shift to uh, Thursdays providing sufficient meals to cover Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then would this also mean an extra couple of days with the added furlough days into the extra week? I'm not sure I understand your question. Would this or, mean or not a the couple extra of extra days? days? But the three extra snow days would have meal snow days, as well. Yeah. Uh, yes, 
that's my understanding. Yes, it would uh, in, it would increase the uh, meal uh, one week into the year. Great. Okay. Into that's, the summer. Excuse me. That, that's another huge win. Any further questions or comments from the board? So um, I think it's, uh, the numbers are very preliminary, I, I understand. And we don't really at this point have, um, have a solid idea of what kind of budget shortfall we're gonna be looking at. Um, but I think it might be important to, uh, in order for, for folks to understand why ten million dollars is um, is a significant amount of money uh, to save, um, would somebody be willing to give a a kind of ballpark uh, best estimate right now of the kind of shortfall that we're likely looking at? I'm going to defer that question to the person with the most knowledge of that, our Deputy Superintendent of Business and Operations, Ms. Hurt. So we, thank you. Uh, we are preparing um, a $60 million um, tiers of reductions um, for uh, Portland Public Schools. Um, internally, we are um, looking at different tiers, and but um, looking at a possible sixty million dollar shortfall. This is Director Lowry, and this is this is uh, sort of my quick and dirty past president of a local school foundation. Math is that we always set our goals: a hundred thousand dollars is about equal to one teacher. So I know this is apples and oranges, and it's not the same thing, but $10 million is around 100 teachers. Um, and I know there's other factors to that, but that's kind of how I've been thinking about it is if we can, that's gonna be, even if we lose 60 million, that's a huge impact on some of that staff, we can still retain them. So just to add- Pretty close thumbnail, uh, Director Lowry. We had uh, one final slide there in our presentation, uh, just to help sort of provide a more uh, a continued response to that question, but uh, it's it's true. The resources could support over 100 FTE. Uh, I wanna appreciate the uh, cooperation of all of our labor partners um, because those FTEs uh, likely represent uh, across the board, uh, many of the folks that, that keep PPS running. Um, um, but again, uh, it, we're, we're preparing tiered budget reductions to 60 million. Uh, hopefully that's a worst case scenario. Hopefully it's much better than that. Uh, we have our vision. We're continuing to work on our strategic plan. Uh, that remains our roadmap. Uh, we identified some shifts in there. So these savings, you know, help us take us part of the way uh, to any anticipated budget gap um, and informs the conversation about uh, in these areas, uh, what can we continue to, to prioritize uh, in the coming school year? So I have a question and then just a comment I wanna make. Um, so my question, uh, just a clear point of clarification. Um, and I know that these conversations have happened with our uh, staff, but I think we've all heard the stories about just the challenges that the Oregon Employment Department has had in processing the claims um, that have come in and sort of unprecedented, unprecedented um, numbers. Um, and just to clarify, all of our employees and any other employee groups that participate in work share, uh, the, the district or the local jurisdiction or the employing entity, they make a batch claim. And so there isn't the onus on individual employees to file um, for the claim, correct? Yeah, there is an initial, it, this looks much different uh, from the employee point of view than 
And when I say this, I mean the workshare program looks different from the employee point of view than a typical unemployment uh, benefits application. So the employee uh, needs to complete an initial claim form uh, as well as um, a direct deposit uh, form it, uh, it, that happens at the very beginning of the process. And then the weekly submissions, which are typically the responsibility of a laid off worker, uh, where you have to demonstrate uh, and certify that you are ready, willing, and able to work and that you are looking for work. Um, that part of the process goes away because it is the employer in a work share program who submits a weekly certification of the reduction in hours and the reduction in compensation. There are some, you know, hurdles uh, to get through. Uh, the Oregon Employment Department has been um, a very uh, strong partner uh, with us as they have tried to uh, and are in the process right now of identifying uh, a streamlined way uh, to address uh, our uh, application. And then just the other question I had, um, just a point of clarification, because there's been some commentary in the community about the $600 a week that um, was part of the CARES Act for um, employees. And um, just looking for the confirmation that this, that Congress was very clear that they intended for there to be this additional weekly compensation on top of the unemployment um, payments that workers would receive, correct? Yes, that is correct. The, um, there was a uh, discussion uh, it, uh, when this, before this was passed about whether or not it needed a cap, whether or not it, there needed to be a cap of what, uh, uh, based on employee typical income uh, and the uh, decision, they did not uh, put a cap in there. So the intention of this money through the CARES Act uh, is uh, to infuse communities where COVID-19 uh, is having a financial, um, is having a, a significant financial impact on workers. So this is the very intention, this use uh, is the very intention of the uh, CARES Act money. Uh, and I hope that other employers consider uh, this as an alternative to laying off workers because that is the intention of the money. And Sharon, if I could just, this is Andrew, if I could just jump in on exactly that point, just to confirm that. I think that's really important. And, and I think we, we've all been getting some emails around this sort of questioning. And I, the reality is this is exactly what the, the funding was intended to be used for. Um, Congress had the ability, as you mentioned, I'm just gonna repeat basically what you said. They had yeah. the ability to put caps in, they had the ability to restrict it. Um, they chose not to do that. And I think they did that very intentionally. And I think one of the things that's, that's being lost a little bit in the conversation is millions of Americans are already taking advantage of this $600 um, a week um, unemployment, either because they've been laid off or, or because they've been uh, had schedules reduced. Um, and so I think this is, you know, um, the idea that this is somehow taking advantage of a loophole is, is really false. I mean, it's actually, it's actually taking advantage of the program the way it was designed to be taken advantage of. We are suffering a potential $60 million loss. We are reducing pay by 20%, which is really material for our staff and our teachers. The federal government has stepped in to say that in those situations, we're willing to provide this, 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 this new benefit, this very generous benefit as a result. Um, and so I just, I, I just want to thank you um, and your staff for, for sort of doing this research. It is transforming um, how other local governments are looking at this issue. I can, I can let you know for sure that that's happening. Um, PPS was um, a leader in terms of looking at this and, and other governments now are also looking at this. And, and, and again, it's not just government, it's private sector, it's nonprofits. Um, you know, this applies to everybody. And, and I think that I, I would actually love it if if we get a little bit of media attention on, on what's happening in the private sector as well. Because um, if you listen to podcasts, you know, like Freakonomics or Planet Money or The Weeds, I mean, they're talking about this exact situation where employees are having their schedules reduced. Um, and in fact, they're making more money as a result of this, this, this generous federal benefit, which was debated by Congress and passed um, somewhat remarkably, but, but it, is, it is the situation. We're in. So anyway, thank you for that, for this work. It's, it's, it's really exceptional. Well said, Director Scott. I can attest to having for, heard from several school board members from other districts today about exactly this plan and how did you do it and how can you 
how who can guide our staff through the same process so it's really it is good work and it is um taking advantage of exactly what the process was supposed to be doing for the employees right now so um it's thank you again also for the um depth of the conversations with each of our employee groups um i know that wasn't easy it wasn't simple um but in the end um we have to approach anything like this in partnership um with our our labor groups so thank you for all of that work any further questions or discussion from the board before we vote on the issue at hand uh, it, just one one final thing to consider is just the positive economic impact to the community of this money coming in that then gets spent in the community to support local businesses going forward. So uh, there's there's a multiplier effect here as well. Absolutely. So um, I just wanted to make a final comment unless other people have questions. Um, I also wanted to thank the staff for bringing it forward. Um, I think it's really um, demonstrates sort of proactive, nimble problem solving um, that's keeping students and their needs at the center of their work. And also want to thank the governor for publicly stating that um, she intended to waive Oregon's waiting um, week, which is really important because it's just additional um, potential savings that we can use for next year. Um, you know, as we're facing a dual threat, the coronavirus pandemic and also the crushing economic environment for public institutions, nonprofits and businesses. Um, you know, it's one of those things where we're going to need to be laser focused on preserving instructional time. And I think this is a great example of sort of proactively looking at what next year might look like. Um, if I look back to 2002 and three, PPS went to extraordinary lengths and the community, frankly, to avoid shortening the school year or having any school furlough days. Um, teachers took a pay cut or the, you know, 10 days of working for free. All Portland taxpayers paid additional 1% income tax surcharge. PPF staff had reductions in benefits. School buildings were closed. A whole host of things happened in order to preserve instructional time. Um, same thing in the Great Recession. PPS avoided school staff furlough days. Um, and as we look at the tough choices um, that we're going to have over the next year, I think tonight um, is only you know one in a series. Generally, um, I don't support school staff furlough days as a cost saving strategy. Not only is it result in a reduction in uh, pay for school staff, but we just get less instructional time. Um, so I had to sort of weigh like you know what do I think about um, us having furlough days, and I think I'm totally um confident in this being the right call um because I, I do believe as was outlined earlier tonight that we're trading um much higher value school days with students in classrooms next year with their teachers for the current distant learning days in which students have a fraction of the time with their teachers as they do normally uh so in that case i think this is um, you know, when we think about it now, it's a hard decision, maybe a hard decision to make, but for next year when we have students back in their classrooms, that um, those are exactly the days that we don't want to have to be considering a furlough day. So just the trade-off is for me well worth it. Um, I, I do want to acknowledge that um, we have had some concerns from community members about the proposal. And I can understand why parents would be frustrated with the current situation, um, but I don't think it's unique to PPS. Um, there's been a responsibility that's been shifted from parents uh, from the public education system because of the COVID um, pandemic and those require and the requirements from the state. So um, I, I can totally understand where parents uh, may be coming from as they as they look at this. Um, so um, that's understandable. It's Again, not unique to PPS, and I say I think we're going to have higher value days next year. Um, also, there is a community member um, or parent who may have interpreted earlier communications that decisions had already been made prior to the board meeting, um, the discussion, and that's not the case. I think um, all board members benefit from hearing from community members, even when they disagree with us, as it helps inform our decisions. 
And then just finally, um, I want to just close again by thanking the staff, especially Sharon Reese and the HR team, um, because I do think this fundamentally protects really important instructional time and unprecedented um, and challenging times for our country and for the state and school district. And of course, thank all the school and administrative staff who partnered with us to make this happen. Thank you, Director Brim Edwards. The board will now vote on resolution 6109. All in favor, please indicate by saying yes. 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 All opposed, please indicate by saying no. Any abstentions? Resolution 6109 is approved by a vote of seven to zero with student representative lateral voting. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you again. Sure. Thank you uh, to the board for considering this proposal. I also want to publicly commend Sharon Reese and her dynamic team with backup from Liz Large and many others. Uh, I think when you say PPS is blazing a trail here, that's particularly true. I know that many of us have been fielding phone calls from both uh, districts here in the state and out of the state. And so I think we're going to start a trend here. So thank you for your support and your consideration tonight on this resolution. All right. Um, Thank you. Next, we move on. We have um, some appointments to our Citizen Bond Accountability Committee. Uh, Director Scott, would you like to introduce this item? Great. Yes, I would love to. Thank you. So um, tonight we get to appoint three new members um, to the um, Bond Accountability Committee. So I'll just I'll give a really brief overview um, of where we are. So currently, um, the Bond Accountability um, Committee allows for 10 members. Uh, we only have six right now and three of those on the committee. Uh, their terms are expiring at the end of 2020. So this is really important to get some new folks onto this committee. Um, and we actually have a little bit of a staggered process. We're going to appoint three people today, um, and then in a few months from now, we'll be appointing some additional people um, to the committee as well, um, allowing these folks to get on board in a new batch. Um, but I just, uh, tonight we have Beth Woodward and Norm Dowdy and Greg DiLoretto um, who are appointing. So just really briefly, it's an incredibly um, accomplished group of folks um, that are willing to serve on our, our Bond Accountability Committee. Beth Woodward is a retired senior management auditor from the city of Portland. Um, I had to laugh because I was pretty sure that I uh, uh, experienced at least one, if not multiple uh, audits by Beth when I was at the city of Portland. And I was able to find one, I think from 2010, uh, which was actually positive and found that we had um, we had responded to an earlier audit effectively. So um, that's not the reason best getting on the Bond Accountability Committee, um, but it was nice to go back and see that. Anyway, she um, uh, worked for the city auditor. Um, she's a certified construction auditor. She previously worked for CH2M Hill um, and some other jobs as well. Um, and uh, she holds a Master of Public Administration and an Associate in Applied Civil Engineering Technology degree. So she has spent a, a good chunk of her career um, doing the kind of work that we ask these members to do. Um, Norm Dowdy is a retired construction industry executive. Um, uh, he was the principal and vice president at RNH Construction. He was involved in a number of local projects. Um, I think really interestingly, he, he served on boards of the local chapter of the American Institute of Architects and Cedar Sinai Park Li Senior Living Community. And he's been active in industry organizations on um, the American Institute of Architects, Architectural Foundation of Oregon, and the Urban Land Institute. He has really deep Oregon roots. And then finally, um, Greg DiLoretto um, is a past president and chair of the Committee on America's Infrastructure, the American Society of Civil Engineers, and he's a retired CEO of the Tualatin Valley Water District. So he has a public service career and also um, an incredible depth of knowledge um, in this field. So uh, I think we're really fortunate to have these folks um, on, um, uh, willing to give a significant amount of time uh, to this committee. It's extremely important overseeing the 2012 and 2017 bonds and then potentially a future bond as well, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, but uh, really, really just grateful for them for their time. So I would encourage the board to support these. The other thing I would say is that um, we always can use uh, additional nominations. Um, again, we have a few people that we're still talking to who might be interested, we'll bring forward later. Um, one of the things that we as a board have talked about is trying to diversify um, our boards and committees and the, the uh, um, uh, the, the appointees we have, and I think that continues to be an issue and a challenge. Um, I think that's a challenge that we as, as the seven board members need, need to take on. Uh, and again, this has come up previously, but um, um, I have been, uh, you know, racking my brain to try and find folks in the community who are willing to serve and, and particularly um, uh, 
uh, uh, people of color who are willing to serve on these committees. Um, any of you who have leads, please feel free to forward them to me uh, or Dan Young. Uh, we're happy to contact people, walk them through the process, talk about the commitment, what it means. Um, but we really do want to make sure these committees are as representative as they can be. Director Scott, if I may, this is Jonathan Garcia, Chief Engagement Officer. Uh, Dan and I have been in communication this week about that exact issue and, and, and topic. And so uh, we look forward to, uh, to uh, bringing forward uh, a, a lot more diverse candidate uh, pool uh, to the board. That's and Director Scott, I'd also like to forward a couple of names. Would I send that to you um, just directly? Yeah, send it to me and and Dan Dan Young as well, and and we can we can get in touch with those folks and and um, yeah, that's fantastic, Michelle, Director De Pass. Thank you. You're welcome. That's great. Let's get this resolution on the table. Thank you, Director Scott, and thank you to everyone who has done some legwork in trying to uh, bring good candidates forward. It's really an incredible um, volunteer role. Um, that is so valuable to the district. So uh, again, we can bring on another slate within the next six months. We still will have, uh, is it two or three open positions after uh, assuming we approve these? Um, this will take us to nine people, but then again, three are ending their terms at the end of the year. So we we'll really will have four open positions at the end of 2020. Okay. Um, the board will now vote on resolution 6110, recommendation of new members to the bond accountability committee. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Director to pass moves and Director Bailey seconds the motion to adopt resolution 6110. Ms. Bradshaw, do we have any public comment on this resolution? Do we have any further board discussion on this resolution? All right, the board will now vote on resolution 6110. All in favor by saying yes. 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 All opposed, please indicate by saying no. Any abstentions? Okay, resolution 6110 is approved by a vote of seven to zero with student representative lateral voting. Yes. Thank you, Maxine. And thank you again, Director Scott and um, Dan Young and Jonathan Garcia for helping with that process. Um, okay, our last item is um, a resolution to advocate for and approve additional federal education funding. So um, Superintendent Guerrero uh, referenced at the beginning of our meeting that he has been working with uh, other uh, superintendents of large urban school districts around the country to advocate for more federal support for school districts. Um, board members and board representatives to the Council of Great City Schools have also been engaged in the same process. So this is a um, resolution to advocate for and approve additional federal education funding for public schools due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, there is a fourth round of congressional pandemic relief um, in the works right now. And um, to date, the direct relief for, for public schools has been fairly minimal. The statistics I've seen is that it's been less, of one, less than one half of 1% of the entire first um, three um, coronavirus relief packages um, going to to um, public school districts. And, you know, as we all know, um, with the picture that we saw earlier tonight about the very dire um, prospects for our state budget and similar cir circumstances for state budgets around the country, um, it's really uh, needs to be part of the national conversation that uh, public school districts um, need some relief in this moment, especially when we know that our students will be facing significant learning loss and our needs will not only not be the same, they will be greater um, than before this budget crunch. So um, I would like to ask if we have a motion um, to put this resolution 6111 on the table. So moved. Director Moore moves and Director, do I have a second? Second. 
I believe that was director to pass. Sec seconds the motion to adopt resolution 6111. Um, Ms. Bradshaw, do we have any public comment? No. Um, is there any board discussion? Yeah, I, um, this is Director Brim Edwards. Um, I just want to um, actually make sure that we, and our resolution I think reflects it, but to thank the um, delegation so far, um, Senator Merkley and Wyden, and then specifically uh, Congresswoman Von Michi and um, Congressman Blumenauer, um, who represent um, constituents in the Portland School District, because I do think they've been our advocates and um, we did receive some funds in the first the first round, um, but as Chair Constant no noted, um, not to the extent of um, previous years. Um, so I think we should just note that we're you know thanking um, our federal delegation for the assistance so far and um, really looking forward to their partnership in um, delivering for public schools um, in the next package. Thank you, thank you very much. Really important point, and they have been um, great partners. And I guess I just wanted to mention one other thing, which is that the importance of our passing a resolution like this, even especially considering that our our delegation is already on board and acting as our advocates, is that it enables us to speak with a, a united voice with other school districts around the country. Um, and that's that's very powerful representing um, school school children in urban districts around the US. So um, other boards across the country are passing similar resolutions. Um, any further questions or discussion? I would also, this is Director Lowry, just like to say thank you to Superintendent Guerrero and our other uh, leadership for working with the Council of Great City Schools on um, advocacy and making sure that we are leading not just for Portland students, but for students all over the country. So I know our it's not only our congressional delegation that's on board, but our staff has already done a lot of work and planning with others around the country to help serve students. Yeah. Can I um, just, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say the council is on the offense and the defense. Uh, there are also attempts to infringe on uh, resources intended for public school systems. So uh, that is a, also an ongoing conversation just for the board's awareness. Director Moore? Um, yeah, I wanted to just, uh, this is in the resolution, but I wanted to say it out loud, um, just to provide some context for the, the level of federal support for public education in the midst of an economic crisis. Um, the, uh, the, the existing, uh, the CARES Act that was passed uh, includes only $13 billion to support public education funding um, during the crisis. And by way of comparison, in response to the 2008-2009 um, Great Recession, um, the legislation that was passed at that point um, between 2009 and 2010, um, the federal government gave $110 billion to public education. Um, and if you look at the unemployment figures, um, we have had a steeper decline in the economy in the last month than um, happened at all in the Great Recession. And we're seeing nationally unemployment figures that are essentially equivalent to the worst period during the Great Depression. Um, so, I would hope that the, the federal government, that Congress would um, exercise its wisdom and uh, understand that uh, public education plays um, an enormous role in the lives of children and families and communities, and um, we need help. So uh, I'm, I'm very happy that we as a board are endorsing this resolution. It, it just to take the conversation to full circle too. Um, it also keeps people employed because as we know, st uh, budget state budget cuts directly translate to layoffs because 80% of our budget are our employees. So if we are to feel those cuts, 
those are going to that's going to be people without jobs and as in many well, communities well across the, i'm sorry go ahead sorry in many communities across the country school districts are often the largest employer and yep. here in portland i don't think we're the largest but we're certainly among the the top mm -hmm. three in terms of a uh, number of employees mm -hmm. all right thank you thank you uh, everybody excuse one me other, one other comment uh i hope uh it's certainly it's important to advocate for public education i hope we are also while we're doing that supporting funds for state and local governments because our children and their families need mental health services uh, health services uh, juvenile services uh, housing services and so on thank you director bailey um, okay the board will now vote on resolution 6111 all in favor please indicate by saying yes yes yes, yes. yes. all opposed please indicate by saying no any abstentions Resolution 6111 is approved by a vote of seven to zero with student representative lateral voting. Yes. Okay, we still got you, Maxine. Literally, um, it's almost time for bed. I know, I think we all feel the same way. <laughs> One last bit of business to do, uh, committee and conference reports. Um, Director Scott, can you give us a preview of the uh, school improvement bond committee meeting that will take place later this week? Yes, I absolutely can. And so we have a school improvement bond committee later this week. At, I was just checking the time. It's at 4.30. Um, so I look forward to seeing um, not only members of the community, but as many board members uh, as are able to, to attend would be great. So to give a little bit of preview of the conversation we're going to have on Thursday, um, you know, as I think we've, we've heard a lot tonight, um, the district is, is currently all hands on deck in terms of supporting students, families, and staff through the COVID-19 crisis, and it is consuming a significant amount of time. Um, and it's really hard. We, we heard from the budget conversation. We heard from other conversations making decisions about the future, you know, in this, in this time of uncertainty is, is difficult. It's required some flexibility and, and some rethinking. Um, just, uh, you know, pre-COVID, which I feel like, you know, we can all divide our lives now between when we used to go to work and now when we work at our dining room tables, um, that, you know, we were considering this eight year um, $1.4 billion bond package and that, you know, that amount would have been invested in health and safety and modernization pro pro projects throughout the district. And, and I think most importantly would have renewed the, the current tax rate, right, and, and would have maintained sort of the tax rate that, that voters were, were generous and, and you know, um, voted for in the 2012 and 2017 bonds. Um, I think now with the, the, the COVID pandemic, um, it's really highlighted the critical nature of our school facilities. Um, and the need for us as a district to be resilient in the face of, of, of these types of emergencies, um, there's also a huge impact on the, um, the economy. There's a huge impact on the community. And even as we were talking about the CARES Act and, and the issue of, of, of people losing their jobs and the unemployment rate, we, we know that that's happening as well. Um, and, and I think what we've seen in our own experience is that uh, while we're facing these budget cuts, access to technology is, has never been more important for the district. Um, as we focus on this distance learning and, and sort of adjust to this new life. So what we want to do in, in this Thursday meeting is come back and have a conversation about the best way to move forward and, and really sort of sort of look at, you know, is, is the current um, um, proposal the best way to move forward or do we want to look at something different? One option we're going to be talking about on Thursday that's going to be on the table is, is um, again, continuing this sort of idea of, of, of renewing the current tax rate, but doing it for um, a shorter period of time and funding some projects that would really address some critical needs that have been underscored by this COVID crisis. So these are things like updating PPS's technology infrastructure to improve access for all students, um, improving access to devices um, for students and teachers, um, updating our curric curriculum throughout the district, um, especially as we expand distance learning platform. And then I think also equally important is making sure we complete the work on Benson, um, which has been started and ongoing and, and there's a gap to fill there. Um, and I think that this 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 type of investment would would continue our long range bond program. It would keep it running. It would keep staff, you know, working on this um, and uh, allow us to invest in some of these critical areas um, that we may need as as we go forward over this next year. Given so, some of the uncertainties, um, it would continue again, sort of the same current tax rate, and and we can have more conversation on Thursday about that. 
Um, the idea is, you know, again, voters were really generous. We have a tax rate at a certain level. Um, if we do a shorter bond, we can we can do a shorter amount and go back out in, in two or four years. What we had been talking about was waiting eight years and, and a larger dollar amount. But either way, that tax rate um, stays the same. And 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 really talking about what this means. If we were to do a shorter term resiliency bond, what that means for the longer term program and when we do come back and, and, and focus on modernizing the schools and, and finishing the high schools as well. So it's the beginning of a conversation um, and something we're going to be talking about later. Um, and I just want to, um, you know, again, I would encourage any members of the public that are interested in, in listening, um, you know, to tune in. Um, I would encourage board members who are able to come um, have that conversation. I think it's a really important conversation about the future of the district. And um, also. Also for the public, of course, um, all the materials uh, for that meeting will be posted, um, uh, which will contain some more specifics about what's under consideration. Yeah, um, any decision on, on referral of a proposal is not likely to happen until later summer. So we're gonna have some conversations at the bond committee meeting, and then there's some community engagement that we're talking with the district about as well over the next few weeks. And, and uh, to sort of get a sense from 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 uh, from the residents and parents and students, uh, you know what their highest priorities are. Um, so with that sort of overview and intro, um, what I would just say uh, in terms of wrapping up the committee, this committee report is is if there are any specific questions or concerns that board members have, um, you're welcome to to bring those forward on Thursday. But you're also welcome to bring them forward today if you can't make the Thursday meeting, or if there's something you want us to look into between now and then. It's 48 hours. Um, Happy to do that as well. Really thinking about how we can be responsive during the COVID crisis to the district's highest priority. So this is a question maybe for staff. Um, is the um, Thursday meeting going to be um, uh, the video available so that if, if that's where the discussion is going to happen, that people have access to, since they can't come to the meeting, to be able to have access to a video conference like this? Yes, this is Roseanne. Yes, it's going to be live streamed like this and an opportunity for people to uh, provide comment too in the same way. So there'll be a, a public comment slots. Yeah, I think we have two at the top of the meeting um, and people can reach out to the board office to Kara to sign up um, similar to what we do for our board meetings. I just have a quick uh, process question. Um, why the why we limit it to just two com two comments, or is that two commenters? Is that just yeah, for time? It, it is. I think it's just a time constraint. I mean, I would I would defer to Roseanne if she has any history here. My understanding is it's just a, because it's a committee meeting, we limit it to two. Um, uh, we have we have usually not filled those slots, so I don't think. In my brief tenure, or less than a year, um, I don't think we've had a situation where we've had more people who wanted to speak than we had slots available. Exactly, and certainly, you know, what I've experienced with our committee chairs is that we have more people that want to. Certainly, there's, uh, you know, room made for public comment. So, but we plan, we plan time for two at the beginning. How's that? Thank you. Yeah, I was going to agree with Roseanne that it's, uh, I believe it's up to the discretion of the committee chair. Yeah. Is kind of how we, it's not a hard and fast rule. All right, we look forward to that conversation on Thursday and um, really moving this important discussion forward. Um, is there any other business for the good of the order? So I just want to flag just, just from the audit committee. Um, that there's a body of work that's going to be coming to the full board. It's um, that will need to be probably completed in the next month and a half. Um, as everybody recalls, we had um, eight action items from the Secretary of State's audit that were specific to the board. Um, so, um, in a conversation with uh, Deputy Superintendent uh, Claire Hertz, um, we've decided we're going to put together a preliminary framework of what we believe um, the board has done to date in terms of um, actions related to that related to the rec recommendations that were board specific, but at a certain point in time, the full board will uh, need to be engaged in that discussion again, probably the next couple months before the Secretary of State's office comes back for their review. All right, thank you very much, Director Brim Edwards. 
Um, all one, right. Uh, the uh, next uh, Director Constan, one final thing. Uh, love to hear an update as to where we are on. Yeah, that's the cat. Uh, amazingly loud cat. Um, <laughs> weighs about three ounces. Uh, where are we? Where's uh, where are we with policy work? And uh, I'll take my answer offline. Okay, thank you very much. Um, all right, this meeting of the Board of Education of Portland Public Schools is adjourned. It was nice to see all your faces. Thank you, staff, for your helpful presentations tonight. Uh, the next meeting of the Board of Education will be held May 26th. Take care, everybody.